When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. With that kind of bold opposition, no wonder God will call the boldest of prophets. Because a king on the level of an Ahab, a queen on the level of a Jezebel, will require a prophet on the level of an Elijah to face them. So as we now turn to his stories, oh, brace yourself for some, some pyrotechnics, some real fireworks, literally. Uh, the next three chapters are the ones that this week's material focuses on in Come Follow Me. 17, 18, 19, is, that's the ministry of Elijah. And you'll meet him in these famous stories of the widow of Zarephath, of the, the contest with the priests of Baal, uh, the still small voice he hears uh, in the mountain. These are three of the most famous chapters in the Old Testament. I, I hope that all that we've already discussed this week puts his ministry into bold relief. It strikes the contrast to see that light amidst the darkness, and it would take someone on his level to be able to push back against it. So let's see these famous stories and drill down deeper as we shift from, from uh, political to ecclesiastical, from state to church. We're going to slow down. I know that scares you. We, we've gone slowly already. But there was a lot of summarizing we needed to do to get through these kings of Israel and Judah. Here, these next three chapters at least, it is worth going verse by verse and practicing the skill of close and critical reading. Notice every detail you can. In verse 1 of chapter 17, Elijah the Tishbite, now that either means he's from a town called Tishbe, which is a possibility, or the word might play on a, a Hebrew word meaning dweller or resident alien. So he's just not from these, this area, but he's passing through. He was of the inhabitants of Gilead, and he said unto Ahab, so this most wicked, the worst of the worst uh, in, the, in the land of Israel, this is all happening up north, he says to him, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, I think Elijah is using more than just oath language here, as strong as it is. That phrase, as the Lord liveth, is the strongest language you can use to swear something. Because you're swearing on the existence of God. And I know he lives and you know he lives. And so we're, we're holding to this. God will keep us honest with this covenant. But did you see with Ahab, Ahab doesn't believe that the God of, of Israel exists. So I think more than just calling a commonly believed witness, Elijah is saying, you better believe that God lives. You need to know it. This is a statement of absolute testimony. Our God lives despite all you're doing to try to kill him. In fact, Ahab, you better hope our God is alive. Because he's the only one that's going to be able to reverse what I'm about to do. Because as he said in that verse, no dew nor rain unless I say so. I'm about to seal the heavens and create a drought. And the only God that's going to be able to reverse that will be mine, not yours. And so you better hope that the Lord God of Israel liveth or you won't be living long yourself. You see, this idea of sealing on earth and having it sealed in heaven, bind on earth, bound in heaven, that's why we always associate the sealing power with Elijah. That's why he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration so Peter, James, and John could receive the sealing power in the New Testament. That's why he appeared in the Kirtland Temple so that Joseph and Oliver could receive the sealing power in our dispensation. That sealing power is synonymous with Elijah, and here he's using it for the first time to do what? to seal the heavens in hopes of what? Well, jump-starting the pride cycle. It had kind of stalled out in wickedness. And they weren't changing because, oh, I believe we're surviving in our wickedness. Well, let's make it a little harder then. And let's nudge the pride cycle towards destruction. 
through drought and famine. And once you hit rock bottom and know that <laughs> the only way you're going to have any hope is if someone above sends rain down below, well, then are you going to turn to God? Then hopefully your humility will lead to repentance, which will then lead to deliverance. That's the good half of the pride cycle. So let's get things going. Elijah's going to move him in that direction. In this, he's the same as Nephi, son of Helaman, in the book of Helaman. When he receives the sealing power and is told, you can bind on earth and have it bound in heaven, what's he do first? He binds heaven as well and makes sure there's no rain. The verse that describes it, his intent anyway, is Helaman 11 verse 4, where Nephi prays, O Lord, do not suffer that this people shall be destroyed by the sword. And yes, there had been incessant war between Israel and Judah through the reigns of all these wicked kings we've been studying so far. So Elijah could feel very similar. Nephi goes on, but O Lord, rather let there be a famine in the land to stir them up in remembrance of the Lord their God, and perhaps they will repent and turn unto thee. That was Elijah's hope as well. And we'll see how that hope unfolds. In verse 2, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith. That is before Jordan, so some small little tributary that feeds into a little larger river. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Okay, so at least I'll be preserved through this period of famine. Uh, drinking from the brook, sounds good, that's probably what I would have done anyway. And eating, wait, eating from what? Ravens are going to bring me food every day. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Elder Holland once joked about this and said, you know, unless ravens have a carrying capacity a lot bigger than I assume, uh, Elijah wasn't exactly living high on the hog. In fact, this is something that struck me. Uh, Elder Holland didn't mention this part, but in the book of Leviticus, when it's going through the kosher laws, guess what one of the unclean animals is you're not allowed to eat? Ravens. So, man, God must really be scraping the bottom of the barrel uh, not only are there no clean animals for you to eat, but I don't even have clean animals to deliver food to you. Uh, your DoorDash driver is going to be an unclean bird. Oh well, maybe that reassures us that God can even use the unclean as instruments if they're willing to be used by Him. That should give us some hope. Sometimes we, we're ravens too. But what's interesting here is, like Elder Holland joked about, this isn't going to be much. What is a raven's ration? Who knows? But that's what Elijah is going to have to subsist upon. And yes, it will be, give me this day my daily bread. Because I don't think a raven can fly in with a week's worth. This is going to be manna all over again. And just little by little, God making sure I can make it through today. And then tomorrow, I hope he'll help me make it through tomorrow. You see more of that in verse 5. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. So that raven's ration wasn't even enough to make it through the full day. He had to split it up and I'll, I'll bring you breakfast and I'll bring you dinner. And oh, you might lose a few pounds during the middle of the day. Now, when it says bread and flesh, I have no idea what it is. Uh, it could have been anything. And again, back, this goes back to ravens. Ravens are omnivores. That's good. So they can eat just about anything, meat as well as berries or whatever. And so I'm sure that uh, Elijah is getting somewhat of a balanced diet from these omnivores. He's one too. Uh, and so as they, as they bring. But I wonder also about the meat because ravens are also scavengers. They'll eat carrion. Uh, dead animals. Maybe that's why they were unclean, considered unclean. Now, it doesn't say what kind of meat they brought, uh, and meat can also just be a word for any kind of food. But if ravens are bringing things, has Elijah's subsistence been brought down to that level? Where I don't even know where this meat came from. Is I know a raven isn't kosher. The, the meat that he brings, is that kosher? I don't know. I'm not going to ask. I'm hungry. And God has provided, and so I'm not going to look a gift raven in the mouth. In some ways, this reminds me of Nephi and Lehi and their family in the wilderness when they're supposed to eat raw meat. 
and somehow their women can still nurse their children and somehow they're surviving on this. Can you imagine the amount of faith in those prayers that this food may bless, bless it to nourish and strengthen our bodies and not give us some kind of food poisoning? I imagine that Elijah is learning to rely upon the Lord during this time period. And that's the lesson he's hoping that everyone else will learn along the way. Now in verse 7, it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So now not even that is an option anymore. And Elijah's going to have to be on the lookout. Where's my next source of drink? Because I can go a day or two without uh, the ravens, but I'm not going to last long if I don't find a replacement for the, for the brook. Well, here comes the replacement. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Now, Zarephath and Zidon, or Sidon, there's the Sidonians, that's north of Israel. That's outside of Israel. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, to borrow a word that we use today, th this is a non-member you're sending me to? <sighs> you already made me eat from an unclean bird, and now I have to go to an unclean woman? Isn't there anyone in Israel I can go to? Now, I doubt Elijah thought those things, but I love the fact that Jesus uses this exact story to pop some bubbles among the Jews of his day that were xenophobic, anti-other, that were tribalistic, it's all about us, that were exclusivist without being inclusivists right alongside it, uh, chosen without choosing others. When Jesus said, you know, there were probably a lot of hungry widows in Israel during Elijah's day. I wonder why he didn't help them. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, Elijah is being blessed by an outsider. And we need to be open to outside influence that's positive also. Now, he says then, next verse, Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Another important detail. She already knows he's coming. Don't lose sight of that. The Lord now here is telling Elijah, go to the widow of Zarephath. But at some point, he's already said to the widow of Zarephath in some way, someone is going to come that needs your help and you are to sustain them. Now, you wonder how that's going to make her feel because I can't even sustain myself or my son. How on earth am I going to sustain a stranger? But this is somewhere in her, the back of her mind, or this sinking feeling, this pit in her stomach. What if somebody comes, oh, I hope I'm not right in that impression. Well, she is right. In verse 10, Elijah arose and went to Zarephath. So immediate obedience on his part. And when he came to the gate of the city, so here's a place of judgment, and how will she judge or be judged in this situation? And behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. A widow. She'd already lost so much. She's gathering sticks, and he calls to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, notice what he asks for, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, that's it. Uh, and I, w I wonder if it comes as a total relief to this widow woman. Again, I've been prepared. I've been warned. I've been scared to death. Somebody's going to come and ask me for something. I have nothing to give. But here comes someone, and they start to ask, Oh, excuse me, woman, would you mind? Uh oh, here it comes. Here comes the request. He's going to ask for uh, food, and I don't have any. He's going to ask for help, and I've got nothing to give. And what's he ask for? Could I have some water? In fact, just a little. <sighs> what a relief. That is something I can spare. As we go through this story, there doesn't, yes, it's a drought, but she must have uh, a brook that was better than Cherith. There's, there seems to be no hesitation on her part. Like I said, this probably came as an immense relief. That's all he's asking for. He asked for the one thing I can give without it costing me too much. And so she scurries off to go get this little water. But verse 11, as she was going to fetch it, so there were no questions on her part, no complaint on her part, no hesitation on her part. Probably <laughs> relieved, that's all he was asking for. So good, before he increases the request, let me book it out of here and get what he asked for. But he called to her and said, Oh, one other thing I forgot. Uh oh, here comes a pit in her stomach again. Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And her heart sinks. That's 
more than I can give. You asked for the doable, now you're asking for the impossible, and I can't do it. This is beyond anything that I can actually give. Oh, come on now, it's not that much. I just asked for a little water, and I only asked for a morsel of bread. Surely you can spare that. Actually, I can't. This goes beyond mere self-sacrifice. Or, in reality, this is the complete sacrifice of self. I can't do it. So she says in verse 12, she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, thine. I'm not an Israelite. I know you are. You have a God. Ours seems to have abandoned us. I'm not sure where yours is either. But wherever or whoever he is, as he lives, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruse. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. You want to talk about a meager last meal? Just a handful of grain? Just a little oil? He wasn't asking for much. Little water, morsel of bread. Well, she had less than the little. And it was only enough. Actually, it wasn't even enough for her and her little boy. You ever cooked something over an open fire? How many sticks did it take to make the fire? You ever made a two-stick fire? Because that's all she's gathering. <laughs> to get two sticks, make a lit... That's all, yeah, little flame. It's like roasting a marshmallow on a, on a match. Because that's all we have, and it doesn't even matter. Because tonight's our last meal, and if it hadn't been, then yesterday would have been. We're going to eat it and die, and that's it. So if you would please allow me the dignity of being able to spend this last meal with my little boy and part bread, the tiniest of cakes. Maybe that'll fill our stomachs because they're so small already. But, that, but, but I'm sorry. I would give you what I could, that water, but I can give you nothing more. Actually, it makes me wonder if she was even going to eat any of that final cake. I doubt it. Sensing her mother heart, I bet it was her son's last meal. She had already had hers. In verse 13, however, Elijah says to her, Fear not, which is the one impossible command. You have any idea how long I've feared ever since I lost my husband? Who was there to provide for me? Ever since this drought began and I realized there was going to be no grain in the fields to glean. So fear not, that's impossible. Well, there's another impossible command for you then. First was not to fear. Next, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me and after make for thee and for thy son. Now again, I'm not asking for much, just a little cake. But what I am asking for is that you prioritize this. It's the order that matters. He could have said, oh, go ahead and make your cake first and then just check again and, and see if you might have enough left over. You shake out the, the cruise of oil. There's maybe one more drop in there. But maybe, do you have a third stick? You might need to keep it going, keep the flame going. But no, that still would have been a miracle. But the miracle that that he was after was the miracle within her. Will you put someone else first? Now, I'm sure she'd already done that with her son. But will you put a stranger first? Will you put an outsider first? Will you self-sacrifice and lose yourself to be able to find someone else first? Do you remember those great phrases in the Sermon on the Mount? Before you seek ye first the kingdom of God. Then everything else will be added to you. Or the great phrase in Jacob, before you seek for riches, even before you seek to feed yourself or your family, seek for the kingdom of God. And after you have obtained a hope in Christ, you'll seek, you'll, you'll find all the things that you seek because you'll have them in proper perspective by then. And that's what he's helping this woman or trying to help this woman to develop. Put God first and then see what follows. He then makes the promise in verse 14, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, this is 
the God of Israel. This is our God, but he's looking out for you also. He's the God of the whole world, the whole earth, the universe. He's not as provincial as your deities are. So this is what he says. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Oh, spoiler alert, I shouldn't have said that. And maybe Elijah shouldn't have either, right? Because the bummer of spoilers is it just takes all the drama because you know what's about to happen. And doesn't this kind of spoil the drama of this story? I mean, honestly, if this were all fictional and I were writing it, I would have left out verse 14. I would have just given her verse 13 and said, oh, no, just feed me first and then we'll see what happens. And inside I know the miracle that it awaits, but ah, I just want to ratchet up the drama and the intensity and see if she'll do it. It does kind of spoil things when you tell her in advance. You'll have plenty. Uh, this will work. Feed me and you'll be able to feed your son. Not just today, but until you'll be able to glean in other gardens. And the rain falls and the, and the grain grows again. Now, I want you to think about what I'm trying to describe here. The intensification of the story. And I guess to me the question is, does it need to be intensified? I remember the first time that I thought this, of eliminating verse 14, to ratchet up the drama, I felt the Spirit whisper, a widow woman and her son about to partake of their last meal. Is this not dramatic enough for you? The least God could do is reassure her in advance that all will be well. And that's the way the Lord is, because that's what I realized. I know God's promises. <laughs> Spoiler alert, he's already promised that he'll give me all that he has, that he'll forgive my sins, that he'll exalt my family, that he'll keep us together eternally. It's all there. He's already said he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing more than I can even have room to receive. Then why is tithing still a, a leap of faith? He promised that, that all my sins would be forgiven if I would turn to him. Then why does it still gut check when I have to trust the atonement, the atonement of Christ? He promised that families can be eternal. Then why is death so scary? Or... Why do children who stray just pull at the heartstrings in ways that make me wonder if God will really keep his word? Because life is dramatic. And these are all leaps of faith. And even though God has already promised us, even though he's already given us his word, we have to trust that he is the word of God. Our test, in some ways, is no different than the widow of Zarephath. And yes, like her, we know in advance. Can we, like her, <laughs> exercise the faith to do it? Do we trust our God like she did, even without knowing him as well as we supposedly do? This woman is amazing to me. Because in verse 15, she went and did According to the saying of Elijah, what faith, what courage, what self-sacrifice. And yet, what's the promise? Exactly as God had said. And she and he and her house did eat many days. The barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruse of oil fail. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. God is as good as his word. Prophets can be trusted to relay his messages. The miracle happened. Can you imagine how she feels? To put yourself in her mind and heart and this, it's never going to work, but what am I going to do? And it's my only option and because otherwise we're going to eat and die anyway. So whether today's our last meal or yesterday was, it's a last, a last meal. And if there's hope for it not to be my last, then this is my only, this is the only way. And so she makes it on her little two-stick fire, and probably with as much fear as faith mingled together, hands over this tiny little cake, weighed from her last handful of meal. And after he eats it, 
Does she even dare put her hand back into the barrel? Does she dare pick up the cruise of oil and swish it around? Will there be anything there? But as she reaches down and... See, this is the part I wish we knew more detail. Does she reach in and all of a sudden it's full again? Or is it still just one more handful? And is this a test that is repeated day after day after day? Is this the ravens all over again? Because to be honest, I love that parallel. As impressed as I am with the widow of Zarephath, I'm equally impressed with Elijah. Because in some ways, he wasn't asking her to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself. And he'd already done it. In fact, he did it to himself in a way, because he's the one that sealed the heavens. Do I trust that even if I make it impossible to provide for myself, if I give away my last barrel of uh, my last handful of, of meal and my last cruise of oil, if I empty the oil itself and make sure there's no way that God can keep pouring into it, ah, will he provide? I believe he will. And so he does it. He seals the heavens. And if he trusts day by day, the ravens will return. I do wonder if that's the way this miracle took place. Just handful by handful, day by day. Not just an automatic two-year supply down in the, in the cold storage. It's amazing how this unfolds. Even the language is amazing. If you go back to verse 5, when Elijah is told by God, go do this, it says, he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. And did you see the language in verse 15 about the woman? She went and did according to the saying of Elijah. It's the exact same language because in some ways it's the same test and the same faith that got them through it. Will we arise and go like they did? Again, in feeding others, she was able to feed herself. By losing herself in service to others, she found herself. I know it doesn't make any sense. The math doesn't work in tithing. How on earth do, can I do more with 90% than with 100? Ah, forget the math and just go with faith in God. It works somehow. And somehow by, by caring for others, she was cared for. It actually reminds me of speaking of multiplying meal and oil. When Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes, if you read the story in context, it came at a time when the apostles were so busy serving others, they didn't even have time to eat. They couldn't even feed themselves. And in that story, when, was the time, when did they finally eat? <laughs> Remember when Jesus says, does anybody have any food to share? It's only this little boy that has the loaves and the fishes. The apostles didn't have anything. When, he's, when they were suggesting to Jesus, send these people away so they can find some food, they were probably wondering, and can we go with them? Because we don't have any food either. <laughs> when did the apostles finally eat? After they had distributed the multiplied loaves and fishes to the multitudes. That's pretty cool. Yeah, same thing's happening here. Now, in verse 17, it came to pass after these things. Now, the story could have ended there in verse 16, and it still would have been worth our time studying. It still would, have, would make this widow of Zarephath one of my absolute heroines. But you remember what Elijah had said? The miracle has an expiration date. There will always be meal in that barrel and always oil in that cruise until the day that rain falls again. So for this next scene, we have to fast forward. There are going to be some flashbacks and so on. Hopefully we're used to that as we were bouncing, ping-ponging north and south with the kings. But this is after the fact that by now, chapter 18 has already taken place. By now, uh, the rain has fallen again. By now, there are other sources of sustenance. And often God provides for us so that he buys us some time to learn how to provide for ourselves. There comes a point where he wants to wean us off a bit so that we can be a little bit more self-reliant. And that's what happens by the time you get to verse 17. After these things. So here's when the real tests come. And you want to see a test. Here, here it is. The son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. I feel for her. Because this widow woman that had been staring death in the face for so long, and when she was about to say goodbye to her baby, this little boy, giving him her last cake, knowing that whichever one of us dies first, 
hopefully will be buried by the other if they have the strength to even dig a grave. But he lived, he survived only to be taken later. We're going to see this story repeated next week in a different context with different people, but in some ways, wouldn't the natural person within you just think, why did you even, why the first miracle? If it was all taken from me later on, this is absolute devastation on her part because what mattered most to her was ripped away. How is she going to react? What has she learned about God and about Elijah through all these day after day miracles? Is it enough to get, are the small miracles, and I don't even want to call them small, but the daily miracles, are they enough to convince you that God will be with you for the big one? This is David's lion and bear experience preparing him for Goliath. This is the widow's woman. What have you learned about God and his servants every time you've made a cake? What do you know about him now that you need him most? In verse 18, she says to Elijah, what have I to do with thee? O thou man of God, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? We'll see it clearly in Job, but this is the reigning mentality of the day that all sin leads to suffering and vice versa. All suffering is the result of sin. The fact my little boy would die, of course it's my fault. Of course it's things that I've done and God has taken it out on him. Death of innocence to haunt the guilty. Is this what you've, is this why you preserved our lives? So you could throw it back in our face? Well, then what am I to do? Now, verse 19, Elijah responds. What he's about to do is to prove to her, no, God is not collecting on your debt. He's giving you something again. He's proving in yet another way his, his miraculous power, his incredible kindness. He says to her, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Did you catch the detail? Where was this little boy? Elijah took him out of her bosom. Where else would he be? This mother clutching the lifeless body of her little boy to her breast. Probably soaking his hair with her tears. Why has this happened? And Elijah, recognizing the tears of a, of a widow who's already lost a husband and now has lost her only son, he lifts this boy out of the arms of grief and brings him to a higher place, a place where Elijah stayed. This is going to be an upper room kind of an experience. This is the daughter of Jairus that Jesus goes to and leaves sorrow and and doubt outside the room and only brings in faith into that setting so a miracle can take place. And the same kind of miracle takes place here. In verse 20, he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? So he's, even he is wondering, this pain, this anguish, is there a purpose here? Why have you done this? This is divine trust, which both he and she had, bumping up against human compassion. I, I feel for the widow, obviously, but I feel for Elijah too. Father, do you have any idea what she has been doing for me all this time? The amount of faith that she has shown. She's been my raven and there's no uncleanness in her. Please, please reverse this. Don't, don't do this to her. Have you ever felt that as a parent or as a leader where you're just hoping for the best for the people that you're leading or a missionary and you see a convert and they make such sacrifice to join the church and you just pray with all your soul that their life will be uninterrupted bliss from that moment forward. And how do you feel when life at times gets harder for them rather than easier? This is parents watching their children do what's right but lose friends over it. Or leaders calling for sacrifice and people make it and they end up suffering more for a time. And there's a gut check. Come on, God, they're acting in faith. We all are. Please come through for them. Everyone's faith is being tested here. 
in verse 21, he stretches himself upon the child. He does it three times. He cries unto the Lord and he says, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. Now, I don't know if this was three times stretching himself upon the child and then praying. Or is it stretch and pray? No, nothing. Stretch and pray. Still nothing. Please, God, stretch and pray. What's with the stretching? Wait for next week. We'll see a similar miracle. And the lesson it teaches is divine. But here you see repetition and this fight of faith. And please, God, he doesn't always answer our prayers the first time we offer them. Well, I just test, faith is being tested just as the woman's is, but he's persisting in his prayers. In verse 22, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Well, he'd heard every time, but after that third, he responded. And the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. Of course he would. First things first. And then Elijah said, see, thy son liveth. Oh, was he praying in gratitude as he stepped down the ladder or the steps? Oh, I'm sure he was. But to reunite to mother with child, to reward faith and humility and self-sacrifice and self-reflection, Lord, is it I? What have I done? What can I do better? This is such a magnificent miracle. And part of the beauty of it is it's the flip side of the miracle that they'd already been experiencing for a long, long time. This first hit me when I was studying John 11 with another miracle of someone being raised from the dead. This was Lazarus. And when you meet a distraught loved one, two of them in this case, Mary and Martha, when they come to Jesus, both of them say identically, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. In other words, it's too late now if only you had gotten here sooner. In other words, we believe you have power to, to resist death, but not power to reverse it. We believe that your, your power comes before the fact to keep people from, from falling, but not after the fact to lift them back up again. Now, what struck me as I was pondering that is there seem to be two types of medicine in the world. There is preventative medicine. Take this so you don't get sick. And then there is restorative or curative medicine. Take this after the fact so you get better. And the irony, I think, as I was pondering this in John 11, is in our day, we seem to only believe in the curative, restorative power of the atonement. We don't seem to understand the preventative power of Christ's grace. Meanwhile, Mary and Martha were the exact opposite. They believed in Christ's preventative power. They just didn't yet understand his restorative, curative power. And Jesus is saying, I've got both. I am the resurrection and the life. And if you just believe, he that is dead shall be alive again. Well, yeah, I know someday. Uh, no, why not today? There's something powerful. And, and, and again, the, I learned that in John 11, but I see it again here in 1 Kings 17. The first miracle was to give, to show, to prove God's preventative power. You're still alive and I'll keep you alive. And every day before you go hungry, I will provide you daily this daily bread. I will stave off death day by day. But the second miracle is the flip side. Even when you think it's too late, it isn't. And Christ's uh, restorative power is as effective as his preventative. Trust in that. For you and for me, whichever one we have faith in, oh, let that faith spread to its opposite. And if, for example, you know and have felt the redemption of Christ that comes after your sins, that's curative, then pray a little harder when you're in the moment of temptation that Christ might fill you with his preventative power, the grace that comes before, not just the redemption that comes after. I testify that both of those are true in the part of, of Christ. And Mary and Martha know it, and now the widow of Zarephath knows it too. I hope we know it and act on it. Well, speaking of knowing, look at verse 24. The woman says to Elijah, 
Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. I could picture Elijah with a wry smile saying to her, well, you didn't know that already? <laughs> uh, daily meals wasn't sufficient? Oh, I know what you mean. We all seem to have a, a, a line down the human heart with faith on one side and d doubt, worry, fear, some lesser emotion on the other. Call it what you will. It's the father of the man that came to Jesus in need of some help and said, Lord, I believe. That's one half of my heart. Help thou mine unbelief. That's the other half. And in fact, hopefully it's not half. Hopefully it's becoming a negligible fraction. As the line moves, the more and more I know that God comes through for me. Here she knows it. However much or little, she knew it before. Oh, chapter 17 is a masterpiece. It, it needs a sequel of equal power. And it has one. 1 Kings chapter 18 is incredible. If it would have happened, some, if I'm getting my chronology correct, by reading closely and seeing the details of 17, this would have happened somewhere in the middle because the famine in the land has yet, not yet ended. Uh, this is the day that it's going to come to an end. And then it seems that after the fact, you'll get the second half of the widow of Zarephath story. Anyway, chapter 18 begins and the Lord tells Elijah, it's time to shift some tactics here. We've tried famine. Hopefully it's worked to a degree. Now let's try rain. You see, there is proof that God can seal the heavens. Let's prove that he can unseal them as well. So it's time to go see King Ahab. And we're going to start round two of crying repentance. You see, this is like what we saw in DNC 43 about the Lord's alarm clock. He tries everything. And sometimes it's the, joy, the voice of justice, and other times it's the voice of mercy. And sometimes it's blessings, and sometimes it's curses. And he's going to try everything in between to try to get us to change. Uh, scarcity is what he's been doing the last several years. Now let's go with abundance. Or you could put it this way. We've tried the stick. Now let's, let's lay out the carrot. Here also, we get to meet one of Ahab's servants. It's a quick pass, like we've seen in so many of the other kind of uh, one-and-done experiences with these men of God. This one uh, is a righteous, God-fearing man. His name is Obadiah. He works for King Ahab, which is, must have been an interesting experience for him. But maybe this is his hope. Uh, maybe I can influence Ahab for better, or if nothing else, keep my friends close and my enemies closer, because uh, this is what he's up to. Yes, he was governor of Ahab's house, which makes him kind of a Joseph to a Potiphar or to a Pharaoh or to the, the, the jailers. Uh, it's interesting how wicked people can still respect the righteous, even though they don't want to follow their standards. That may be the case here. But verse 3 tells us something about Obadiah we should honor. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, even more than he feared Ahab and Jezebel, obviously. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Ah, so he is the raven to these hundred prophets, providing for them right underneath Ahab and Jezebel's eye. It's, I mean, the fact that there were a hundred is amazing. No wonder we keep seeing men of God pop up with these one-hit wonders and we don't hear anything more about them. They're out there, but no wonder we don't get much information because they, they seem to be in hiding and hiding from Jezebel. She's the, the puppet master here behind Ahab. We'll see more of that in a moment. Jezebel has cut off God's prophets, which makes Obadiah's act all the more courageous that he would put himself in harm's way. If they find out what I'm doing, I'm one of Ahab's right-hand men, governor of the house. Okay, I'm going to do this, though. And what's he doing? He's providing and protecting. Hmm, think proclamation to the family. Okay, are we doing that at personal cost? I love Obadiah here. I love these hundred prophets. I wish I knew all of them. But it, keep this in the back of your mind. It proves that Elijah, who's the star of our show here, is not the only one out there. Okay? Now, Ahab and Obadiah, kind of going hand in hand, trying to keep the kingdom afloat in the midst of this of this uh, drought, they split up and go in search of water. And in hopes that wherever they find water, they'll find a little bit of grass along the banks. And, and if we can find some grass, hopefully we can keep the animals alive long enough to get out of this drought someday. 
Now, when they've divided and conquered to go out, neither one finds water or grass, but Obadiah does find Elijah. And he's like, what? You're around? You're alive? Uh, I haven't heard anything about you and where you've been. It says in verse 7, as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that, my lord, Elijah? I, I can't believe my eyes. Do you have any idea how hard Ahab has been searching for you? He's so ticked. The last time he saw you, you said you were going to steal the heavens. And he didn't believe you, but now he does. Uh, he didn't believe in the God of Israel, but he's starting to have second thoughts that someone's up there that's stronger than his God. And uh, yes, he kind of hopes your God lives enough to, to stop this thing, but he doesn't want you to live. He is livid. I mean, honestly, everywhere that I, Ahab's been going around the kingdom in search of water, grass, or anything else, in search of Elijah, he's been asking people, do you know where he is? And he's been threatening them. If I found out, find out that he's been here and you've been harbor, harboring a fugitive, uh, you're going to have the same fate as all these other prophets that my wife has been dispatching with. This is scary. Now, Elijah says, oh, well, I've kind of been uh, out off the grid, let's just put it that way. Okay, I've been off the grid for a while, but here I am, and I actually want to go see Ahab. So why don't you go back to your master and have him come here to see me? Now here, Obadiah gets a little nervous. He's like, um, I don't know where you've been, but I'm sh pretty sure that God has been preserving you. He's probably been kind of whisking you from place to place to stay one step ahead of the bad guys. Uh, and I'm really afraid if I go to Ahab and say that I saw you, and tell him where you are. By the time we get back, I bet God will have <laughs> whisked you away to the next spot. You're back off the grid. And then I'm the one that looks like the guilty party. And, and then I'm dead. And I got 100 people back home that are banking on me, stick, sticking around. So no. And then Elijah reassures him, I'll stay here. Okay, I promise. I'll be on the grid. Uh, right here, just go get Ahab. Tell him to come back. And he does. Ahab comes running, and in verse 17, it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? In other words, this famine is your fault. You're the one that sealed the heavens. Now, Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. All of these false gods of your wife and surrounding nations... That's why this famine, this drought was necessary to jumpstart the pride cycle. You're still stuck in your pride. You need a little destruction. How's it taste? Oh, sorry, I used that word. You probably haven't eaten much lately. Well, nobody has. And it's on you, not on me. This is when the, the student starts complaining to their teacher. I can't believe you gave me this grade. And the teacher says, oh, I don't give grades. Students earn them. And so you wonder why things aren't better in your kingdom, Ahab. Don't look at me. Look at yourself. So Elijah says in verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. I want everybody here. And the prophets of Baal, 450. The prophets of the groves, 400 more. All those which eat at Jezebel's table. Now she's providing for them somehow. I wonder whose fields she's gleaning in. We'll see, what, we'll see later the kinds of approach she has to taking other people's territories. But she's providing for her priests, uh, just as she is destroying all the priests of Jehovah. But gather them. I want them all here. It's interesting, by the way, that Elijah would tell Ahab to do it. Because it's not just, I want to have a big throwdown contest with the priests of Baal. No, I need an audience, and the audience needs to be all of Israel. I want them to come and see what's about to happen, because they'll leave with a testimony unlike the lack of testimony they have right now. So, but, but here's the thing. I can't invite Israel. If I go around and tell all the Israelites to come and assemble at Mount Carmel, they'll be scared. To, I mean, Obadiah was scared to even be seen with me. So no, this command has to come from you. So let me set it up this way. I want you to gather all of Israel. You'll do the dirty work there. They have to listen to you. Uh, and then gather all these wicked priests. And we are going to have a throw down, knock out, drag out fight uh, between the gods. This is going to be a, a, an epic battle. In fact, speaking of those gods, let's, let's introduce ourselves to them. 
We've seen already that there is the prophets of Baal and prophets of the groves. And the groves, that's Asherah. So Baal is male and Asherah is female. Uh, you wonder if this counterfeit heavenly parents, think along those lines. Uh, we've seen that Baal is a counterfeit lord, that's his name. Asherah is a counterfeit tree of life. Uh, which is, again is gendered female in, the, in Lehi's dream. Anyway, powerful symbolism here. And as far as Canaanite religion is concerned, Jezebel's uh, beliefs and the Canaanites all around her, Baal is the weather god. See, first of all, there is a god over all things named El. And we see Elohim, there's some similarity there. But he also has a, a female mother goddess, and that's Asherah. Ashtoreth is another way to pronounce it. And they have all kinds of children. Baal is one of the most important because he's the weather god. Now, do you see why drought and famine uh, has been the contest so far? Uh, I thought your god... I mean, Baal and Asherah should have a pretty good relationship, right? Because it's Baal that brings the weather, the moisture, so that Asherah has a chance to grow. Well, those two gods don't seem to be on speaking terms, at least not for the last few years, huh? Ahab, huh? Jezebel. So let's see what we can do about getting them to be on good terms again, shall we? Uh, will Baal come through for Asherah or not? Now, there's more than just this, because he said specifically, let's do it at Mount, at Mount Carmel. Because Carmel is home court advantage for the Canaanites. Uh, you see, it is a coastal uh, mountain range in northern Israel. Uh, and it, it's this huge outcropping of earth. Oh, earth, that's Anat. Anat is the Canaanite goddess of the earth. So that's kind of home court advantage for her. But it's also a great place for Baal and Asherah to come together. See, Asherah is more than just grove. It's also vegetation and fertility, growth, right? Uh, and again, you need the moisture, the weather, to be able to provide for that. But there on Mount Carmel, all this moisture from the Mediterranean Sea comes up and then comes up the hill, of the, you know, Mount Carmel, and starts to pour rain down. There's more rainfall on Car Carmel than anywhere else in Israel. There is a massive, or was a massive, oak forest there. So Asherah, she's already growing there because Baal comes to Carmel more than anywhere else. Carmel means the vineyard of El. So it's home court advantage for your, the, the chief god of the Canaanites. Uh, I'm trying to set this up in your favor. Stack all the cards against me. Well, once all of Israel comes and assembles there, and since the Canaanite pantheon pretty much lives there by default, right? Uh, do we have everyone present? Uh, 450 priests of Baal, you hear? 400 priests of Asherah, everybody present and accounted for? All Israel down below? Because if so, they're my first audience. In fact, they're my real audience. And in verse 21, Elijah says to them, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Oh, you can hear a pin drop from the top of Mount Carmel because they are, they're caught. And they're caught between two masters, not sure which to serve. Sadly, they've been going with the flow, it seems, and following Baal because that's what their king and queen are demanding of them. But when are you going to push back and fight against it? When are you going to choose the one true God and hold to him? I love the way Elijah says it. How long halt ye? You've got these two opinions. This is Moses back, uh, I've said before thee, life and death. So choose life. This is Joshua there in the valley between Gerizim and Ebal. And which do you want, blessings or curses? Here you are in the valley. Make a choice. Pick a mountain range and start to climb. And here, what are we going to climb on Carmel? You're going to climb to God or you're going to descend down to Baal? The choice is yours. And quit waiting without making up your mind. This is Elijah's equivalent of Joshua's clarion call. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah, there's Egyptian gods on one side and Amorite gods on the other. But what about the God of Israel in between? Here, in this case, why wait? Why waver? We're going to make this obvious. We're going to let winner take all. Because if it's Baal, fine. Then I guess it's in your best interest to follow him. But what if it isn't? What if it's Jehovah? 
You see this at the end of section one of the Doctrine and Covenants, that in the last days it will be a period of polarization. No more middle ground. Satan will have control over his dominions and the Lord will have power over his saints. There's no more spiritual Switzerland, no neutrality. Pick a side and dive in the trenches because the bullets are starting to fly. So don't halt. Choose. In verse 22, Then Elijah said unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. Now, either Obadiah didn't tell him about the other hundred, or he's trying to keep it under wraps so that Ahab and Jezebel don't know he's not alone. But as far as here on the mountain, that is totally accurate. I'm, I'm, this is one against, what, four, uh, 850. Because I'm the only one on the, on the Lord's side, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And I didn't even mention Asherah. So here's Elijah setting up the two rival sides. Okay, are we keeping this straight? Which one, uh, what are the betting odds down in Vegas? Okay, uh, what are the chances that a solitary saint can overcome the multitudes that are worshiping the gods of the world. Elijah is setting himself up as the ultimate underdog. And that's good, because we love an underdog story, right? Well, here's how it unfolds. Verse 23, Let them therefore give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves. I'll give them first choice. Cut it in pieces, lay it on wood, put no fire under, and I'll dress the other bullock, take the leftovers, whatever, and lay it on wood and put no fire under that one either. And that way, you see, we'll bring in the rest of the Canaanite pantheon while we're at it. This is going to be even more in favor of Ahab and Jezebel than ever. Because, like I said, what's the symbol of El? A bull. And so there's the bullock. Well, let's bring El to the, to the table. We'll actually sacrifice your chief god. The wood, there's Asherah, the mother goddess. There's the groves. They probably had to cut down a few even to provide the wood for this sacrifice. And then their children will invite Baal. He's the weather god, and that's what we're looking for. If we're not going to light any fire under, because the fire needs to come from above. What we're asking for is a lightning bolt. Isn't that kind of standard equipment for your precious Baal? And what else? Uh, what about wind and rain? That's Baal's department too. That's what's going to end this, this drought, this famine. Then a knot the goddess of the earth, since Carmel is this large outcropping. She's also the goddess of war, by the way, and this is a fight to the death up on top. Uh, then let's add Yom. He's the god of the waters. And yes, you can see the Mediterranean off in the distance uh, and the water that hopefully comes from above. I mean, Yom and Baal have an interesting sibling rivalry going. That's why the waves thrash upward and the rain pelts downward and there always seems to be a fight out there, storms at sea. And then there's Moat. Can't forget Moat. That's the god of the underworld. Because uh, death, the, the famine has been sending people down to Moat frequently. And since famine could end up being a fight to the death, we're going to make this contest one for the, till the death as well. So you have all of your pantheon here. You got all the gods on your side. Uh, where's the God of Israel? Well, we'll see. We'll see if he comes. In verse 24, here's some more rules of engagement. Call ye on the name of your gods. They've all been invited. In fact, they, they've all been physically brought to the event. And then I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire. So there's the lightning bolt from heaven. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Well, of course it is. You all agree to the terms of the contest because you can't rig this one. We really are just going to sit back and let Baal and Jehovah duke it out. And whoever honors their servant's call, hopefully the rest of the people will see who's really in charge here. So Elijah lets the prophets of Baal go first. And in verse 26, they took the bullock which was given them. And they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon. Oh, wow, it's taken a while. Saying, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, in other words, no clap of thunder, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. Which is interesting because if you are crying out to your God to send a lightning bolt 
to the bullock that's on the altar, and there you are leaping on the altar itself, what are you doing? You are standing in the way of the lightning bolt. It's as if you are kind of burying your chest and daring your God, strike me down. This is life or death to us, and we're willing to put our lives on the line for this. This is self-sacrifice. Won't you accept this offering and prove to all the people that you truly are God in heaven? Now, in verse 27, it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. He's getting a little tired of these theatrics. And he said, cry aloud, for he is God. I mean, there's sarcasm for you, since he doesn't believe what he's saying. Well, I mean, where could he be? So why isn't he, he answering? Well, here's some options for you, my friends. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. Now, Elijah here becomes the patron saint of every spiritual smack talker. As my my uh, dissertation was on Paul, uh, Thomas Paine's anti-biblical attacks, but in the research that went behind it, I found that most, throughout most of the Enlightenment and much of modern history, people who attack religion use ridicule to do it. And then that puts the religionists, the faithful, in a rough place because it's like, well, do I fight fire with fire? And they've been mocking me. Do I just mock back? Because others felt that, like, no, that is so beneath the dignity of a man of the cloth that I would never lower myself to that kind of level. Well, anybody who chose to fight fire with fire always referred to this story and said, Elijah did it, uh, so why can't we? They are mocking us. Well, Elijah mocked them. And the mockery is classic. Seriously. What he's saying here is, is actually hilarious. Uh, I mean, he's a god. But then, again, there's the sarcasm. There's the, is he really trying to plant some seeds of doubt within them? But then the list he gives is, is so funny. Is he, is he, maybe he's talking, which could mean he's either talking to someone else and there's probably rain falling somewhere else, but he's, I don't know what you guys have done to offend him because he's not doing anything for you. So uh, maybe you got the wrong number and he's talking on some other line. The other possibility there is, is he talking to you? Is this it? I, I was waiting for a thunder, uh, you know, a, a peal of thunder and a lightning bolt, but is your God like soft-spoken? Is he kind of a pipsqueak? And I, oh, I, I, I can't hear you. Is there a sense here of, oh, I was expecting lightning and I got up, maybe there's a little static electricity. You know, if you kind of rub your, your feet on the carpet, you might get a little, little whisper from Baal. I don't know. Uh, he's totally talking smack. The next one, uh, or late when he says, maybe he's on a journey, just out of town. It's so sad we picked today. We should have checked his calendar. Uh, maybe there's a better time for him. Or when it says, he, maybe he's asleep and needs to be awakened. He, maybe he's not the type of God who is vigilant and keeps an eye out for his people. And man, this has been a long nap. I mean, I know in Canaanite religion and the fight between Yom and Baal out on the sea storms, and surely there are times when Baal wins and sometimes that Yom wins, wins. And so there's, that would explain the cycle of the seasons and rainy season and dry season. So dry season is just, uh, you know, Baal gets beat and locked up, probably hanging out with Mott for a while down in the underworld. He'll come back, it's fine. Ooh, but he hasn't come back in years. It's been one unending dry season and there's no wet season and maybe he just fell asleep and nobody's awakened him. You're probably gonna have to yell louder to wake him up. The one I skipped, by the way, pursuing is the funniest of them all, but it's also the least appropriate. Uh, pursuing seems to suggest he's out chasing somebody, but that was just the King James translators trying to mm, be less inappropriate than the Hebrew suggests. They were trying to clean it up a little bit for, you know, children that were going to read this story. Because literally what, they're getting, what, what Elijah is getting at with that verb is uh, maybe he's in the restroom. Maybe your God, Baal, is out relieving himself somewhere. I mean, you better check what the rain is that's falling out down elsewhere. It might, 
not be drinkable. Is there any yellow snow that's falling somewhere on some other mountaintop? No, it is. This is smack talk extraordinaire. And that's the kind of guy that Elijah is. I always joke with my students that it's, it's like the, the high school pep rallies, you know, when you're fighting over each other and who, which is the best grade or whatever it is. And this is Elijah's equivalent of, we got fire. Yes, we do. We got fire. How about you? And, and there's these priests of Baal looking like idiots that our God it slept, fell asleep in the bathroom somewhere. What are we going to do? Yeah, spiritual smack talk. You got you to gotta love it. Now, in verse 28, they cried out. So they're going to try to wake him up here. And they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Now, this is self-harm. But then again, when they were jumping and leaping around the altar itself, there was potential self-harm to the point of being struck by lightning. So they're just, again, trying to show their gods and goddesses how serious we are. There's another twist on this, because according to some Lamanite, Lamanite, there's some similarity here, uh, some Canaanite religious practice that if you were in total abject mourning over the dead, you would cut yourself and kind of bloodletting. You were draining the very life out of you in mourning over someone who had lost their life entirely. So is that what I, are they mourning the death of Baal? Are they worried that it's too late? Or are they just one last ditch effort to show them, to show Baal how much they would mourn over a true passing? So please come back to life for all of us. So interesting what's happening here. Well, by verse 29, it came to pass when midday was passed and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. This has been an all day affair, but there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. Your God can't speak. He doesn't seem to be hearing. Can he even see? Is he aware of what's happening down here below? Evidently not. So if you're done, and I've given you all day to try, can I have a go? Well, Elijah's turn. And we already saw him stack the deck against himself and give his enemies complete home court advantage. Well, how about this in verse 30? Elijah says to all the people, Come near unto me. I need you to hear this. I need you to see this. You're my real audience. And all the people came near unto him. So literally, he's gathering them to his side, which is what spiritually he's been trying to do for years now. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down, now, there's another great visual aid. I'm trying to show you what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm trying to restore true worship here in Israel. And all of these broken altars, false gods and goddesses, I'm trying to repair the true worship. I'm trying to reform what's been broken. Verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be my name Reminding them of their true identity. A stone for each tribe. Remember when they crossed the Jordan River? There was a miracle with water. To come into a land that had been promised them by God. And set up these 12 stones as a pillar, as a memorial. Something to teach your children about. Have you forgotten those other pillars of stones? Then let's make a new one. Jacob set up pillars. Joshua set up pillars. Samuel set up a pillar, Ebenezer. Will we turn to our God for our help here? In verse 32, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Our sacrifice will be a part of each of us, every tribe coming together to do this. He then makes a trench about, around the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. This is pretty deep, pretty wide. He, this is a moat around the, the fortress. He put the wood in order, thank you Asherah, cut the bullock in pieces, thank you El, laid him on the wood, thank you Asherah again, and said, oh, so far he's doing exactly what the priests of Baal had done, this time he adds a little twist. He says, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. So however long it takes, I don't know where they're getting all this water during this time of drought, but they fill the four barrels and, and totally soak the sacrifice. This is going to make it even harder to light. Well, maybe it's not sufficiently waterlogged uh, if it just kind of poured off and then filled the trench. Let, let's do it again then, okay? So do it a second time, and they did. 
And then he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. Now, do your math here. How many stones were there? Twelve. Why? One for each tribe. Now, how many barrels of water were they soaking the sacrifice with? Four. Oh, but that was the first round. Do it again. Eight. Oh, do it again. Ah, twelve. Now we have twelve barrels of water absolutely soaking. You want to talk about water log. Maybe that's why he split it up into groups of four, because it would give some time for the water to soak into the wood and tr truly drench the bullock. There's no way this thing is going to light. On, right? You ever tried to <laughs> go camping after a rainstorm? Yeah, good luck igniting your fire. But verse 36, now that there's absolutely no way for me to win, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Part of this, because, yeah, you guys took all day to fail. But part of this, too, is lightning up against uh, the sky at dusk. There's just something epic about that. Uh, and so let's, let's make this great symbol of the apostasy, a darkening sky that is pierced with brilliant light from heaven. Well, Elijah came near. He said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and how would you fill in the blank? We always say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but not this time. Elijah says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. Because I want to make this as obvious as possible that he's your God, my fellow people of Israel. Why have you turned against him? Why have you turned to some false God when he's yours? He chose you as his people. Will you not choose him as your God? He is the God of Israel. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Please make this as obvious as you possibly can. And notice the two things he's asking for. The world has to know. Israel has to know. Number one, thou art their God. Number two, I am thy servant. We've seen this so many times. We saw it with Cain. We saw it with Pharaoh. Uh, two years ago in the Book of Mormon, we saw it with King Noah. We saw it with the people of Ammonihah. What are the two questions they always ask? Who is God and who are you, his so-called servant? And our problems come when we forget God and refuse to remember who he has called to represent him, his prophets upon the earth. And so this shock and awe, this firework display, this piercing of the dark sky is going to reintroduce Israel to a God and, his, and a servant of God that they have forgotten. Verse 37, the prayer that ends, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know. That's the same kind of language you saw in Exodus. They have to know the God they don't know. That thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. In other words, that's what this whole famine was for. To turn their hearts back, to jumpstart the, the pride cycle. Are they ready to repent after all of this destruction? Because if so, let the rain come and it will deliver them. It will wash away their sin. It will wash away their forgetfulness. And it will, it will allow them to grow up again in God. Is it time? It was. Because verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell. There's the lightning bolt. He, Jehovah just bested Baal. It consumed the burnt sacrifice. There went El the chief Canaanite god. And the wood, there went Asherah, the goddess of the groves. And the stones and the dust, there went Anat, the goddess of the earth. And licked up the water that was in the trench, there went Yom, the god of the sea. Oh, these Canaanite deities are dropping like flies. Remember the plagues of Egypt? One big contest to show that the god of Israel was superior to the entire Egyptian pantheon? Well, this is the Canaanite equivalent of that. And Jehovah just put down everyone in their place. Except one that we'll see in just a moment. Well, how does Israel react? Elijah had gathered them to his side. Now they're truly on his side. And they begin shouting in verse 39. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. Again, the Lord, he is the God. Now, if you were to say this in Hebrew, the Lord there is the sacred name. It's that I am that I am. It's what we call Jehovah. 
and God, that's in Hebrew, the word Elohim. So in a way they are crying out, Jehovah is Elohim, and they're Elohim as a title, not as a personal name. If you shorten both of those to the way that they're usually used in names, Jehovah becomes Yah, and Elohim becomes El. And so the Lord, He is the God, becomes something along the lines of Yah is El. Or if you just switched it around, El is Yah. My God is Jehovah. El I Yah. Elijah. Now, talk about God sending the perfect person to personify this whole thing. Elijah means my God is Jehovah. And the people finally have truly sided with him. They're basically invoking his own name. Oh, verse 40, Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. You see, that was the final God that we hadn't mentioned. In a way, he's taking on a knot all over again, since she's the goddess of war. And yes, we're going to win this one. But also, what about Moat? He's the one that wasn't mentioned before. The god of the, of the dead, the underworld. Well, he just got a whole lot of people coming in his direction. Capital crimes, deserving of capital punishment, as we've seen so many times before. But also, well, you did put your life on the line. You were willing to be struck by lightning by your god. Well, in a way, you were struck by ours, at least by his earthly representatives. And the people were part of this battle. In verse 41 and 42 then, one, well, a few last details. Elijah says to Ahab, now that I've beaten you, get thee up, eat and drink. No, you're not allowed to mourn your defeat. You need to get up and celebrate it because guess what? The drought is over. Oh, you who troubled Israel, even when you accused me of being the troubler myself. Now eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Oh, it's going to start a downpour. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink as required. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. This is bold indignation before Ahab. Smack talk before all of his priests of Baal. But this is meek and lowly humility before the God of Israel. There's no... He doesn't hit play We Are the Champions uh, as the soundtrack for the end of this epic battle. No, he comes humbly before God to thank him for proving himself for the people, just as he had always proved himself for Elijah. What happens next is interesting. Elijah sends his servant to look for a storm coming from the sea, go, go to the westward side of the mountain. And he goes, and after six unsuccessful attempts to see any change, he goes and looks, and nothing comes back, says, sorry, nothing to report, go look again. And two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and finally on the seventh one, which seems fitting, totality, perfection, creation has culminated. Verse 44, on the seventh lookout, he says, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand, and... Elijah was okay with little things that could fit in a hand. That's what the widow was feeding him with all this time. And he said, Go up, saying unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. You better hurry home, my friend, because there's about to be a, a flood. Uh, this little tiny speck of a cloud off on the western horizon is coming. And to help you see the end of Israelite apostasy... That's the hope here. No more famine in the land, and now the living, the, the, the living water will descend and bring back up the bread of life. That's what we're hoping for here. Well, Ahab gets on his chariot and starts the journey home. But then in verse 45, it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain after three years of drought and famine. Ahab arose, went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And then, interesting end of the story. And he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now, as the crow flies, or the raven perhaps, that's about 11 miles away. 
this is going to be a half marathon. And yet uh, Ahab on chariot and Elijah fleet of foot. There's a race and Elijah gets there first. Now, this is one of those examples like we saw back with Sisera, uh, that the, the chariots are actually a military disadvantage if the ground is wet. If it's sufficiently uh, waterlogged and, and marshy, then the wheels just sink into the soil and you can be up to the axle before you know it and it's not going anywhere. Well, that rain that was blessing Israel was now cursing its king, Ahab, and it slows down his progress home to the point that Elijah can outrace him and beats him there. There's actually an interesting twist. Uh, the best article I've seen on this was something that was written by uh, John Tvetnas, I think like 30 years ago. Uh, and he's the one that describes all this Canaanite lore and so on, and all the, the pantheon that's beaten. But he also pointed out that according to some Canaanite myths uh, that were found in these Ugaritic texts, that there was a, a myth that the gods would have contests with each other. And you could tell the winner because it was the one who could throw, throw lightning bolts most accurately and who could, who could run faster than anyone else in a race. And so this might be another way of getting some, some digs in against the Canaanites by Jehovah just showing that I, I was the master marksman on the, on the lightning throw. And my mere servant is faster than you when you're on a chariot. And Elijah wins the race. This whole chapter is a victory for Israel. If they'll have it. It is an introduction, a reintroduction to their God. If they will remain in relationship with him. This is a call to Ahab and Jezebel to repent. You who have been slaying Israelite prophets, prophets to Jehovah, have now lost hundreds of prophets to Baal and Asherah. Are you ready to give up on Baal and Asherah yourselves? Well, not quite yet. And in fact, not quite yet for Elijah because he still has something to learn as well. And we see it in chapter 19, which is another masterpiece chapter. You see, by now Ahab has returned home. He tells Jezebel what happened. Tail between his legs, I'm sure. Uh, you're not going to like the news about your priests. Okay, brace yourself. We're going to have some extra food on the table today. Uh, not as many friends coming over for dinner. And in verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah. She's livid. And she said, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, I'll kill you or I'll die trying. And in 24 hours, we'll tell the tale. Well, Elijah hears about this and flees for his life. You know, I mean, it's one thing to mess with Ahab, but you don't want to mess with Jezebel, okay? He ends up going and hiding in the wilderness. And in verse 4, he sits down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. He said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. I wonder what, what he means by that and why he's seeking death. Is it simply relief and release? I've won and my mission is over. You've been sparing my life day by day for years, and you got me to my mission's end. And so I don't need any more meal from the, from the barrel. I'm okay. I've done what I was called to do. On the other hand, it could be a matter of, I'm no better than my father's, and they couldn't convince Israel to change. I've just given them the greatest piece of evidence imaginable, and if this doesn't work, then nothing else will. And so I... I I think I'm ready. I think I'm done. But he's not. The Lord isn't done with him. So at, once Elijah falls asleep there under the juniper tree, an angel is sent to go wake him up. And in the process, he provides for Elijah miraculously food and drink. Well, he's been providing miraculously that kind of stuff for years now. But he does it again. And Elijah wakes up. He eats it, drinks it, and then falls back asleep. And you picture the angel going, that. That's not how it was supposed to work, my friend. And so he wakes him up again and provides some more food and drink, which Elijah then eats. But this one's different. In verse 8, he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Now, another name for Horeb is Sinai. Uh, are you seeing Elijah as Moses 2.0? 
Uh, they have a lot in common, to be honest. Great parallels between the two if you want to do that homework assignment. But here, their parallel is a 40-day fast to be with God on Mount Sinai. 40 days, like the 40 years in the wilderness, like the 40 days of, of the Noah's flood, uh, the rain, it, to cleanse, to, to purify, to prepare. Jesus, 40-day fast before his mission begins. And here, on that miraculous meal, I don't know what he ate on Saturday night before Fast Sunday, but <laughs> it lasted him the next month and a, and, a, and a third. Well, here the new Moses finds himself on the old mount. And he finds shelter inside a cave there where the Lord speaks to him. In verse 9, he asks, What doest thou here, Elijah? Oh, well, now he's like Adam and Eve. Where are you? Or another version of that, where goest thou? Adam and Eve, do you have any idea what's next? And where you happen to be standing in the history of salvation? How about you, Elijah? What, what are you doing here? You're a little far from home, wouldn't you say? In verse 10, Elijah responds, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Very loyal to you, he could say. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. Now, the opposite has just happened there on Carmel, right? They're coming back into the covenant. The false altars have been thrown down. It's the false prophets that have been slain. But then notice what Elijah says at the end. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Now, God obviously knows about the hundred that Obadiah has been hiding more than Ahab or Jezebel possibly could have. Maybe Elijah really is in the dark. Maybe he doesn't know about it. Or maybe he just thinks they've got to be, there's no way they could be preserved this long. And I am all that's left. I mean, no wonder he's despairing of his life. No wonder, why keep living if I'm all alone? I remember President Hinckley gave an amazing talk where he talked about the loneliness of leadership. And to think about how, how lonely that can be. I always think of the, the final Moroni at the end of the Book of Mormon. There's loneliness personified. Where for three and a half decades, he's wandering, trying to escape Lamanites, just to preserve the record that he intends to ultimately come to, back to bless them. And for Elijah here, I'm, I'm all that's left. There's no one. And have you ever felt that way? Have you ever worried that Everyone, all my friend group seems to be leaving the church, or I'm the only sibling left that hasn't left. Do they know something I don't know? Or is this a lost cause? Or why keep trying? Notice verse 11 and 12, what God does to reassure his servant, Elijah. And I pray that similar experiences will come to each of you if you ever feel the loneliness of leadership or the loneliness of loss. Of just wondering, how come I'm the only one that is trying to be close to God? Notice verse 11. And he, God, said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Get out of this cave. Go out into the open and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Now, don't lose sight of chapter 18 now that we're here in chapter 19. Because what was chapter 18 about? This contest with the priest of Baal? We got fire. Yes, we do. We got fire. How about you? There's the fire and wind and storm. And these are nature deities. And they're the ones that uh, you can't really communicate with. And they don't tell you anything. But at least they provide for you. Here God reintroducing himself to Elijah in powerful ways saying, yeah, I'm not like them. I'm not just in charge of natural phenomena. I, I, I am that. I, I am the one who provided the rain and so on. But I'm a God who speaks. I'm a God who communicates my will. And if you will be the type of person willing to listen, 
first of all, I will reassure you, you're not alone. I'll show you the way to make sure that others will, will follow. I will lead you along, Elijah. I always have. But it comes in still ways. It comes in small ways. Yes, you got the shock and awe experience of chapter 18. But don't get used to that. I need you to be reassured by something far smaller. Like a handful of meal. Like a handful of cloud on the distant horizon. Like something small. A feeling you have, but one that is deep enough that it's not the fire outside that you see, it's the fire within that you feel. It's not the wind that rends the rocks. Rather, it's the feeling of a rushing mighty wind in the soul that blows away doubt and brings faith in its place. It's not this physical earthquake that you're feeling on Mount Sinai, but it's a change of heart, a rending within that, that transforms you and makes you into someone new. This is all part of my stillness and my smallness, but there's nothing small about the results that come when you hear me. It's interesting in my work as I talk with people that are wrestling with faith and some who have left it a long time ago or are on death's doorstep, just kind of on, I'm on the fumes of faith and that's all I've got. And they often will come with hard questions and we'll talk about those. And I, I don't, when I'm one-on-one -on -one with people, I don't shy away from whatever question they might have. And yet, whatever physical answers are available, uh, and there's a lot of those, at the end of the day, they are insufficient without the confirming spirit of the Lord. Which makes sense why the adversary would shift his tactics. This is something I've been trying to make sense of for a long time. So often he attacks on the propositional, but then he shifts and attacks on the epistemological. Sorry for the jargon. The propositional in terms of this thing, and what about this? And so he'll pick at things. I call it death by a million pinpricks. And explain this in the Book of Mormon. Why, why did this happen in church history? Explain this doctrine. How does it fit with this? And what about this church policy? Why did it change? And, and it's all these things. And each one is just taking a hammer and, and striking blows at your faith. But it's at your faith. And the shield of faith is there to deflect those blows, to quench every fire of the, the fiery dart of the adversary. As long as your shield of faith holds, then you're fine. As long as the Spirit has confirmed and... I, even if I don't know the specific answer to that question, you can't get me to take off the helmet of salvation because salvation's on the mind because I feel the Spirit reconfirming that it's there. You can't get me to take off the breastplate of righteousness because I know that righteousness brings happiness and joy because the Spirit's confirmed that to me. I mean, all these body parts are covered because they're covered with the shield of faith. So you picture the adversary, quit trying to plant seeds of doubt in the head when they've got the helmet of salvation on. It doesn't work. Quit throw, thrusting fiery darts at th their righteousness because their faith is reassuring them that this is the right way to live. We've got to change tactics. And so what does the devil do? He shifts from the propositional. Do you believe this proposition? Can you check the box on this belief? Do you understand this thing? And he goes to the epistemological, which means how do we even know anything? That's what epistemology is. See now what he's done? He's taking on the shield of faith. He's trying to get you to remove that because if the shield of faith goes, <laughs> then you're totally exposed to fiery darts and you'll end up taking off all the armor as soon as any of that fire ignites the, the garments of righteousness underneath. So interesting tactic on his part, I've got to get them to question how they know anything. I have to get them to think that the only kinds of evidence that is uh, admissible is the big and bold, the physical and empirical earthquakes and fire and wind and things that I can measure and weigh and prove visibly, tangibly. Still small voices. No, we got to get rid of that. We've got to get rid of that. We need to force people to stay in the epistemological model of 1 Kings chapter 18. Because if they shift to 19, then it's, we're goners. Then they've got their shield of faith back. So we have to get them to wonder 
Have I ever felt the Holy Ghost? I don't think so. Is there even such a thing as the Spirit? No, that's, that's just the, <laughs> the frenzied mind. That's just, that's just confirmation bias. You were raised with this stuff, so you want it to be true. That's just, oh, a dopamine dump. That's just elevated emotion. That's all. And so people are just kind of trying to get you to, you know, tear jerkers and trying to twist the emotional arm in hopes that you'll feel something and think that it's true. Some have even said to me, the Holy Ghost is just self-induced. To which I always say to them, well, one of two things, either, oh, it is, then induce it right now, because I want to watch. Go ahead, induce. You can induce a lot of emotions, but not real spiritual experience. The other thing I say to them is, if it were self-induced, I would be inducing all the time, because I love the feeling of the Spirit. Sadly, I don't always feel it with me. Not to the intensity that I do in these kinds of still small voice moments. Sometimes when friends or others have, they're all friends, I don't have any others. Uh, if they've come to talk and they question, call into question the possibility of spiritual experience wholesale, not accusatorily and not condemning, I'll simply ask, has it been a long time since you've really felt the Holy Ghost? Because if you're just, if you're confusing it with just a dopamine dump, if you're confusing it with heightened emotionalism, I've felt those kinds of things too. But real moments of transcendence, real moments when the Spirit breaks through the empirical, the rational self, I've sometimes asked people, haven't you ever been surprised by the Spirit? Where it wasn't confirmation bias, because you weren't biased towards confirming anything. It was something out of the blue that you weren't hoping for a spiritual experience. You weren't seeking one. You weren't asking a question. You weren't mm, willing something into spiritual existence. And God initiated the conversation. You didn't. And God confirmed something to you that you didn't even know needed confirming. Has it really been that long that you've mistaken true spiritual experience for mere emotional experience. There's overlap, since God speaks to the mind and heart. There's overlap between my thoughts and God's thoughts. There's overlap between emotion and spirit. But in that Venn diagram, if you are only aware of the narrow overlap, and are missing the entire side of spirit that emotion can't touch, then yes, it's been a while. And you need to get past the earthquakes and winds and fire and feel once again the still small voice of a God who knows you and can speak to you and can change you in the process. Elijah, there's still work for you to do. And you need to reintroduce Israel, not just to a God who blesses, because everybody wants that. But a God who speaks and reveals his will and expects them to live according to his commandments. Chapter 19 is huge in that regard. Well, in verse 13, it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, his shawl, his cloak. What's he doing there? Like Moses, he's just provided himself with a makeshift veil. This is bigger than I realized. And this feeling, this voice that's piercing the soul, I need to cover my face before his presence. I have just, this cave, this in the mouth of the cave has just become my own personal holy of holies. And may I be worthy to be here. He then went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And then the same experience repeats with God asking him, what are you doing here? And him responding, well, I, even I only am left. And then the Lord gives him another answer, which I love. He responds, first of all, with instructions for Elijah to move forward. Three things. Number one, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. So I'm even <laughs> dealing with the politics of non-Israelite nations. Number two, anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. This is a different Jehu. We met a Jehu earlier that was a, one of those one-hit wonder prophets. <laughs> this is going to be a different Jehu, and he's going to be king in Israel. And then thirdly, Anoint Elisha to take your place. You get a successor as well. 
And he'll be our hero next week. But then the Lord adds in verse 18, to your original question about being the only one left, yeah, not so much. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, every mouth which hath not kissed him. You see, Elijah, you're not alone after all. There are others out there who are just like you, faithful, devoted, maybe not quite as bold in terms of talking smack, but they won't bow before Baal. They won't kiss those false images. They are true to me. So if you're ever feeling lonely, please know that there are others like you. That's actually one of the things that amazes me about meeting you out in public. Every time, oh, I watch your videos. And I just, first I apologize. I'm sorry, so they're, long. they're so long. And you're like, no, we love them. Keep going. And I just think, and I've said this to many of you, I'm more impressed with you than you could ever be with me because there's, this is my life. This is what I do. But you've made this what you do on top of everything else that you do. And that blows me away. It reassures me that there are far more than 7,000 out there in Israel who only bow the knee before God. And you bless me by that reassurance. I pray that we can bless one another with similar things. Uh, it's, my wife used to say that when she was on her mission in France and slam door after slam door try, it seemed to convince her that no one in the world believed what she believed. She said she always loved going to church and she especially loved going to general conference because there she was with other people who knew and she knew she wasn't alone in her belief. Now, what's the aftermath of that story? Elijah goes to work on the three missions that he'd been given. He starts with the third because on his way down and back, he meets Elisha. In verse 19, he departed thence, found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. And surely, if you can handle 12 yoke of oxen in front of your plow, handling 12 tribes of Israel is probably going to feel like a cakewalk. Okay, this is the guy for the job. Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Well, that sounds like a still small signal <laughs> of his own. Just dropping a subtle hint that he should follow. Uh, wait, wait, did you drop this? Oh, yeah, is that mine? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, he's not in his face going, please, you need to leave everything behind and follow me. But are, is he discerning enough to know that I'm inviting him? to leave the nets, or in his case, leave the plow, and come and be a fisher of men. Well, in verse 20, Elisha got it. He left the oxen. He ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. So I got the hint. I want to come. I just got a few loose ends to, to tie up. And Elijah says to him, Well, go back again, for what have I done to thee? Now, is Elijah playing hard to get there? <laughs> or is he just honoring agency? Oh, you know where I'll, where I'll be. If you have some things you need to take care of, go ahead. But I'm on the Lord's errand and I'm heading back to my mission field. Well, uh, Elisha must have gotten that hint because instead of tying up every loose end, notice 21, he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. This is about as close to Cortez destroying his ships so that the men were motivated to make the new world work. There's no going back here. Uh, forget putting my hand to the plow and looking back. No, I'm going to take apart the plow. And I'm going to break up the wood and sacrifice the oxen on it. Uh, I'm making a sacrifice of self. I'm, I'm offering my former life. And full speed ahead, I am following Elijah. And more importantly, I'm following the Lord. I'll do anything that's asked of me. Sure enough, after giving all of that <laughs> sacrificial meat to the people, they ate and he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Leave your nets, leave your plow, leave whatever life is holding you back, and go. So exactly what Elisha does. And you'll see him next week. Oh, I'm so excited for next week's lesson. Uh, you'll see Elisha have echoed experiences of what Elijah has done with us today. So many amazing parallels. Yes, he ministered unto him. He followed him in more ways than one. Well, that is the prophetic side of our, of our lesson this week. And now we go back to the kingly side. 
And what we started with, with the ping pong back and forth, uh, back in, in Israel and Judah and righteous or wicked kings, seemed like more wicked than righteous. We're back to that. And in chapter 20, Syria is about to attack Israel. As if losing all of your idolatrous priests wasn't bad enough, poor King Ahab, now he gets home and he gets word that Syria is on the move. They're probably looking like this is now probably a good time to, let's beat a dead horse. Let's ta attack him when he's down, okay? Uh, they form a coalition with 32 other little uh, minor kings, city-states, to attack Israel. And there's even some smack talking going on between the two sides there. There seems to be absolutely no hope for Ahab's side. And then in verse 13, behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, thus saith the Lord, the one that just beat you, the one that's trying to introduce himself. Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Do you, in other words, do you have any idea what you're up against? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. I tried to introduce myself to you by way of defeat. How would you like me to introduce myself to you by way of victory? I don't have to be against you, Ahab. Just you've been against me. I'd love to be for you if you would be for me. So let's try this version. Again, God's willing to come from any angle to convince us to change. Well, trusting God, at least as much as he can, Ahab sends an army out against this massive Syrian coalition, and the Israelites win as God had promised. The same prophet then prophesies and says that the Syrians are going to regroup. They're going to attack all over again the following year, and they do. Uh, this time probably thinking that, well, it was, they somehow had court, home court advantage this time, and uh, we got to switch things up. So let's attack from a different angle. We'll go in a different spot. In verse 23, the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, ah, their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. That's so interesting. This, again, is indicative of the time period where there were all these, there, was, there were provincial pantheons left and right. And there's a God of Israel that supposedly only functions within Israel. Well, he's the exception to the rule. He's the God of the whole world. But an Edomite deity covers Edom, and an Ammonite or a Moabite or a Syrian deity covers that area. And so the thought was, Ah, their gods must be gods of the hills, because we attacked them in the hills and they won. But if they're hill gods, then they're probably not valley gods, and we'll, and we'll fight there. We'll go, we'll go to the plain. In my own situation, I think of home games and away games. And it's easier to win home games. You're in friendly territory, and you're used to everything there. Going to an away game is a little scarier. But I, it makes me wonder... Do we think God is only a home court God? Do we think he can only help us when we have home court advantage? There is something powerful about playing an away game and shutting up the crowd. <laughs> of winning and realizing that I can win here and not just at home. And that was a lesson that, that Israel needed to learn. The Syrians did too. There's no such a thing as, as an away game for the God of the whole universe. Well, the next year rolled around as prophesied, and sure enough, the Syrians come and attack. Verse 27, the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids, but the Syrians filled the country. So these are insurmountable odds, just like they were the year before. But well, that's only as humans see things. Two little flocks of goats, little baby goats against an innumerable host. No big deal. In verse 28, there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said the Lord is God of the hills, but is not God of the valleys. Therefore, will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand and ye shall know that I am the Lord. You'll know I am the Lord of the whole earth. Get past your provincial pantheon of Canaanite deities. You don't need one God for the vegetation, another God for the weather. I'm the only God there is, and believe me, trust me, follow me. It's actually interesting, historically, Ethan Allen, the great Green Mountain boy that fought the American Revolutionary War, earlier, he was from, the again, the Green Mountains of Vermont. But there was some conflict between people in New York State and people up in the Vermont area and they just didn't, obviously, Ethan Allen was on the Vermonters' side. It was his side. And the, the, the New Yorkers were thinking they were going to win. And Ethan Allen, 
who had an interesting relationship with religion, uh, a bit of a skeptic himself, he quoted this verse. He may not have believed all in the Bible, but he knew, he knew it inside and out. And he quoted this verse and said, oh, they're going to learn that the God of the hills is not the God of the valleys. And those that live down in the valleys along the coast, we do things differently up here. And they're going to get used to doing things our way up here in the green mountains of Vermont. Well, I, I love how well people in early America knew their Bible, that's for sure. But do we know God well enough to come to him, whether we're in the hills or the valleys of our lives, that there's no difference for him. There's that great line in, I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour in joy and pain. I worry that we think that God is only there for our valleys. He's there to lift us out of them. He's there to rejoice with us anytime we summit the mountain also. He's equally accessible. And sometimes it's the flip side. We think we're only, he's only available when we climb the mountain of the Lord. And I have to be that worthy and that close to him before he'll ever manifest himself to me. Whereas when we're stuck in the valleys of life, and you can even dig deeper than that, wherever you happen to be, the God of the mountains is also the God of the valleys. And he'll lift you from wherever height or depth you're in and help you home. I'm grateful to have seen his hand in both areas of my life. Well, the battle begins. Again, the Israelites are victorious, as promised. But the king of Syria, when he realizes his back is against the wall and we're going to lose, he begs King Ahab for mercy, and Ahab gives it to him. They enter into a peace treaty, which Ahab was not supposed to enter into. God is trying to deliver your enemy into your hands and clear things out so that you can actually live at peace. Because letting them live, they're just going to regroup and reattack. That Didn't you learn that from last year? This is already the second round of the battle. You're going to let them go and regroup and come again next year? How many times does this have to happen? Uh, what, any other geographic features? He's the god of the hills. He's the god of the plain. Uh, is he the god of the coast? I don't know. Is there a canyon somewhere we can try? Uh, anywhere else that is off limits to the god of Israel? No. So Ahab, you were supposed to end things. In a way, this reminds me of Samuel and Saul and Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Remember, it was supposed to be complete capital punishment for capital crimes. But Saul wants to do things his way. This is, there's a lesson here about misplaced mercy. Now, I need to be very careful here because mercy is seldom misplaced. Um, for the most part, I've said this before, if you're going to err, err on the side of mercy. But sometimes erring on the side of mercy is an error and you were supposed to be obedient, you were supposed to be just. If someone's a hardened criminal and you're just going to let them out every time, at what point does your mercy become enabling? And instead of being just to the perpetrator, you've now become unjust to his victims, past and future. You don't let a serial killer go free out of mercy or you've condemned his future victims. You don't let a sex offender go free and put, let them go back into, into situations to further victimize people. And you certainly don't say it was merciful for you to do so. It wasn't for, merciful for the people upon whom that perpetrator will show no mercy. Now, like I said, you have to be very careful with this. As we're proving a contrary here between justice and mercy, I'm talking about times of codependence, for example, when your mercy is anything but merciful to you or to the person you're trying to, to help. When it gets to that point, justice is absolutely required. And that was the point at which the, the king of Syria had reached. And Ahab did a wrong thing by sparing him. And so he's told about it. You see, the end of the chapter has this really strange story. The Old Testament's full of them, so <laughs> be patient. It tells the story about a prophet, another one of those no-namers or one-hit wonders that just pop up, maybe one of the hundred that Obadiah was feeding. He goes and asks a neighbor in the name of the Lord. So I'm on the Lord's errand and I need you to do something for me. It's going to sound strange, but I need you to hit me. Just like punch me in the face. Okay, give me a good black eye, will you? And the guy was like, are you kidding? There's no way I'm going to do that. Which the prophet basically explains that's misplaced mercy because God needs you to do this. 
even if you don't understand why. And as a result, your life is now forfeit because you didn't do the exact obedience that God had said. Again, this is a weird story. That's why I'm saying be cautious with this and just go, uh oh, I've got to be hardcore and no mercy. I must show no mercy or it's on me. No, we've got to balance it. This was just one of those occasions where no mercy was supposed to be shown. I've wondered, is this prophet kind of reenacting the story of, of Ahab forgiving or making the treaty with the king of Syria when he shouldn't? But for whatever reason, when the man won't hit him, he's then warned, then you'll pay it for it with your life. And he's attacked by a lion and slain. Okay? In, in uh, this book, there seems to be a lot of lions doing, doing, some dirty, doing the Lord's dirty work. Well, after that, the prophet then goes to another person and asks in the same way, God has commanded you to smite me. Please do. And it's like, okay, this makes no sense, but maybe he has his own spiritual confirmation. It's like, okay, I know I'm supposed to do this, and I'm sorry, but here goes. And he hits him. Now, again, strange thing. I'm trying to make sense of it and thinking, okay, is this an indicator that, that even administering justice does hurt the, the administrator of the justice? It's kind of like when parents say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Is that, does it hurt God more than it hurts the person that's being punished? Well, because of the atonement, actually, yes. Christ suffered all of the consequences of sin. So when somebody has to pay the price, he's taking it upon himself as well. So he can literally say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. This is a black eye on me, far more than that. That's, I guess, one possibility of an explanation or an interpretation here. But then again, it might simply be a way of saying, I need to have a legitimate in injury for what I'm about to do. And I can't bring myself to hit myself hard enough in the face to make it look legit. So I needed somebody to do it because God has a mission for me to perform and I need to look injured. Because what he does next then is he put ashes on his face and disguises himself and he goes out to meet King Ahab as if he'd been out on the battle the whole time. Like, see, I'm wounded too. Oh, you think I did this to myself? You think a friend did this? Are you kidding? These were the Syrians. Look at this black guy. Uh, so is that why? Maybe. But then when he goes to find King Ahab, he makes up this story. This is sounding like Nathan making up the parable of the ewe lamb. Or like Joab when he tells the woman, go pretend that you had two sons that one killed the other when you go talk to David about Absalom. Uh, so he's making up this story. And it's about himself. And he says, yeah, I got beat up on the battlefield. And I was out there. I was... One of my commanders gave me a man that I was supposed to hold on to and keep track of, like citizens of rest kind of a thing, POW, whatever. Uh, and in the midst of it all, I kind of lost myself and I lost him. Uh, and so now I'm being threatened, like I'm being held responsible for losing the person I was supposed to hold on to and keep captive or even kill myself. Um, what, what do you say, King? Weigh in on this. What's your judgment? Now, do you see the parallel? I was given a man I was responsible for, and I let him go when I wasn't supposed to. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Are you, are you seeing the parallel, Ahab? Well, like David before him, Ahab's like, wow, what a story. This really happened. Hmm, oh, you look beat up. So yeah, that must have happened. Uh, well, it is your fault. And you deserve the penalty of whatever was done because you can't en let enemies like that go free. You had him in your grasp, and you were told to take care of him. You didn't, and so your life is forfeit to whatever punishment that the, your leader that commanded you to do it is, sees fit to inflict. Well, click, and that is King Ahab's thou art the man moment. I delivered the king of Syria into your hand. You let him go. And so it will be your life for his life, and your life is forfeit. We'll see what happens in the next couple of chapters. Chapter 21 is where you see more of this unfold with, with Ahab and his wife slash puppet master, Jezebel. One of the worst women you'll ever meet in scripture. In this chapter, we're back at the palace. This time Ahab and Jezebel are there. They have a neighbor named Naboth who owns a vineyard. And it is quite the vineyard to the point that, that uh, Ahab and Jezebel find themselves breaking the 10th commandment, which, I mean, why not the 10th? They probably have broken all the others as well. They're, they are coveting their neighbor's vineyard. And yet Ahab, above board, actually tries to buy it, uh, offers to trade for it. You name your price, I can switch it out for a better piece of land somewhere else. It's just right next to ours. And we just want to extend the backyard, you know? I mean, do your king a favor, will you? 
But Naboth answers in verse 3, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. See, it's more than personal property. It's family inheritance. I just, I can't, I can't trade it. I can't give it up. I can't sell it to you. Well, Ahab's totally devastated by this rejection. So, tail between his legs, he goes back and whines to his wife. Oh, Jezebel, he wouldn't do it. And I, I know you wanted this, this vineyard even more than me, and I'm sorry, it just won't work. Well, Jezebel's response to her weakling of a husband in verse 7, she wheels around and turns on him and says, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? It's like, come on, honey, you're a king. You should be able to take anything you want, so be a man. Arise, she said, eat bread, let thine heart be merry, I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Well, since you're not man enough to do it, I'll be woman enough to do it, and I'll take care of things, so don't worry your pretty little head, honey. I'll come back with the deed. She's the moving force, like I said. And there are times where Ahab actually does some good things. I just, I think his biggest mistake was marrying into idolatry. And that spelled his downfall. Uh, she felt like, hey, he's the king, I'm the queen. If he won't do it, I certainly can. I can get anything I want, uh, even if my weak-willed husband won't do it. Well, she arranges for some false witnesses. She probably has plenty of those. Uh, um, even if she lost her priests of Baal and Asherah, plenty of false witnesses around. And she sets them up to go take Naboth to court on a charge of blasphemy. And since it's their word against his, and there's multiple witnesses against him, he is, he is accused of blasphemy, found guilty, and he is stoned to death by way of execution. Well, that cleared the way. There's no one, no one has title to the vineyard anymore. And so she takes it and now can go back to her husband and say, looky here, there's no problem. And it didn't even cost us anything. You didn't have to buy it. You didn't have to trade for it. It's yours. You're welcome. Well, God isn't very pleased with this, obviously. He tells Elijah about it. Elijah has, has been coming back from, from Mount Sinai. And with a still small voice still ringing in his ears, he is told to go confront Ahab. He gives him this message, verse 19. Thus saith the Lord, thou hast killed and also taken possession. Sound like Cain's original secret combination to murder and get gain? Violence? and greed, getting whatever you want. Elijah goes on, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. This will be an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, blood for blood. The punishment will fit the crime. You reap what you sow, law of the harvest, take your pick. But enforced empathy, add that to the mix. Right where Naboth's blood was spilled, Yours will be licked up by the dogs. How's that for an ignominious death? If that's not enough, how about this one for your wife, since she's guilty as charged as well. Verse 23, Of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. That's even worse. For Ahab is just licking up his blood. For Jezebel, she becomes the meal. But verse 25, seems like they deserved it. For there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Yeah, she's the one calling the shots, but he let her. In verse 27, then, it came to pass when Ahab heard these words. What's his reac reaction going to be? He rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his flesh, fasted, lay in sackcloth, and went softly. He's repenting? I mean, even if it's just out of absolute fear of the consequences, Maybe this isn't godly sorrow, but there's enough sorrow. He's actually trying to turn the corner here. Now, is that enough to spare him? No. But, verse 29, the Lord says to Elijah, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. But in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. I will show some mercy upon Ahab. Not enough to make it misplaced mercy. Uh, there will be reaping what he sowed. But the ultimate end of his, of his family dynasty won't be in his life. It's like sparing Solomon. Solomon messed up, but David was good enough to extend the kingdom through Solomon. Solomon was good enough at least to extend the kingdom through him, and it would only split apart in his son's reign. 
Something similar is happening here with Ahab. Uh, your humility was key in all of this. You won't be spared. You'll still die and the dogs will lick your blood, but your kingdom will outlive you. It just won't outlive your descendants. And there we get chapter 22. Chapter 22 is the final chapter we'll spend our time on today, and it's amazing, especially when you add in Chronicles, because we get to meet Jehoshaphat here, and he's one of my favorite forgotten kings of Israel, kind of like Asa. Asa is my second favorite forgotten king. Jehoshaphat's my favorite. He's absolutely wonderful, uh, for the most part. <laughs> We've got flaws in here as well. But we're going to see him come up against Ahab here, and what's the aftermath? He's hardly touched in 1 Kings. We just get this one chapter, and it's a brief moment on the stage. He gets four whole chapters in 2 Chronicles. So let's go there first to get some of Jehoshaphat's backstory, because I need you to fall in love with this guy before we see what happens, okay? It's chapters 17, 18, 19, and 20 of 2 Chronicles, and we'll jump around and see some highlights here. But start in chapter 17, verse 3 and 4, and get to know Jehoshaphat. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not after Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. So first impression. Here's a man who chooses righteous examples to follow. Let's go with David. In fact, let's go with the early David, uh, and be like him. Uh, and as far as the kings of Israel and stuff that's going on all around me, now ignore that. Not the option I want to, to choose. In verse 5 and 6, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents. He had riches and honor in abundance. Uh-oh, is this starting to sound like King Solomon to you? And his heart was lifted up. Uh-oh, now it's really standing, sounding like Solomon. But finish the sentence. His heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. It's like, wait, wait, really? Find somebody to do that that nobody else has done before? And, you're, and you beat the pride cycle, for crying out loud? That's amazing. You got all this riches and glory and honor, and it didn't go to your head. I mean, it went to your heart, and it was starting to be lifted up, but not lifted up in you, lifted up in God. That's amazing. Jehoshaphat, I love you. Uh, I want to be like you. Keep reading. Verse 7, he sends people to teach in the cities of Judah. Uh, he sends Levites and priests, and in verse 9 it says, They taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Remember when we saw that about uh, apostasy during the reign of Asa, that there was no teaching priest? Well, Asa's son Jehoshaphat is making sure that's not a problem in his day. And I love the fact, this is, I think the only place that you really see this, he's... He's training teachers, and he's sending them out. He's extending his influence through other righteous examples. And, I mean, if you're ever going to let people govern themselves, then you've got to teach them correct principles beforehand. And so he makes sure the Levites and the priests are around, and they're worthy, and sends them out to do God's work. He's teaching the people. I know I'm biased because I'm a teacher, but uh, I, I can't think of a better way to help, to help the kingdom progress. In verse 10, the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah, so that they made no war upon Jehoshaphat. So again, like Solomon, a reign of peace. And again, like Solomon, they're sending him gifts and tribute. What's he going to do with them since the temple's already built? Well, notice the next, verse 12. And Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly, and he built in Judah castles and cities of store. Uh-oh. Is it... Solomon's temple, uh, I mean, excuse me, Solomon's palace wasn't big enough. Now he, he wants whole castles of his own. No, bad translation. Castles there is better translated fortresses or forts or fortifications. And cities of store, that's a storage city. Now think about what he's doing. When the riches poured into Solomon's reign, yes, he built the temple. He should have done that, cedar and gold, right? But then he spent almost double the time on himself. And a throne of ivory with carved lions down the steps? Come on, that's over the top. He kept it coming and spent it on himself. Worldliness, materialism, that was Solomon's downfall. It wasn't Jehoshaphat's. What did he do with them? As it poured in, we need greater fortifications. And we need places to store the abundance so we have something to live on the next time a famine in the land comes around. This actually sounds a lot like Captain Moroni, who's building fortifications 
everywhere he can to protect his people. In fact, protect is fortifications, provide is cities of store, and preside, well, that's what Jehoshaphat's doing as king. Again, back to the proclamation. This guy is textbook, provide, preside, provide, protect. And he's doing it just as the Lord would expect. But back to 1 Kings, okay? Chapter 22, this coincides with First Chron or 2 Chronicles 18, parallel stories, almost down to the word. But go to the, the, second, or the 1 Kings 22 version. In it, Ahab of Israel now asks Jehoshaphat of Judah to join him in fighting the Syrians. Uh, I need all the help I can get. Uh, I, I let him go again. I shouldn't have done that. It was stupid. Um, and I'm busted and I'm going to have to pay for it. So I want to attack when the, when the attacking is good, but I could use your help. And Jehoshaphat agrees, probably thinking, oh, well, it's, it's a, wor a worthy purpose because we are fighting enemies of the Lord. So let's go ahead and do it. But he first says to Ahab in verse 5, inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. So let's not rush into things. It sounds good. I mean, I'm ready to sign on the dotted line. But can we seek the Lord's guidance first? Again, I love Jehoshaphat for that too. Let's be sure about this. Meanwhile, Ahab says, fine, uh, I've got some, I still got some priests and, and prophets. Uh, well, which kind are those? No, you'll see. He gathers 400 prophets and asks for their counsel. And all 400 of them, down to the last man, all say, oh, yes, of course, this very wise choice, mighty king Ahab. Uh, and of course, you are the king of Israel. And so the God of Israel is surely, surely on your side. And so follow your plan, go into battle, and God will deliver the Syrians into your hand. So then it's like, okay, Jehoshaphat, good enough for you? Uh, I asked God, or at least asked these prophets, and Jehoshaphat sees through it, like, are these prophets or are they yes men? In fact, are they God's men or are they the king's men? Uh, you seem to have prophets in every back pocket. Um, so verse 7, Jehoshaphat says, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? So I, I love Jehoshaphat's discernment here. Uh, false prophets. No, that doesn't count when we're inquiring of the Lord. We need a true prophet to speak truth from God. Well, the king of Israel says to Jehoshaphat, ah, fine, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. <laughs> I, can you picture it? I, I can't stand this guy. He always tells me things I'm doing wrong. Well, has it ever crossed your mind that maybe it's because you're doing things wrong? Uh, maybe this is a true prophet and you're a false king. Don't just assume you're a true king and he's the false prophet. A little more, Lord, is it I could come in handy for you there, Ahab. Well, Jehoshaphat simply responds, let not the king say so. Just, let's just ask, okay? Don't immediately disqualify him just because he's called you out in the past. So they go and bring in uh, Micaiah. It, it, this is such a great place to, to really wrestle with the question. Do I want, oh, people just, again, do I want yes men? Or do I want people that are willing to tell me the hard things that I may not want to hear? Because that's a pretty good definition of a prophet. Hard sayings, who can hear them, Jesus said, right? Uh, well, those are the sayings that count, Peter responded. Do I want prophets to just rubber stamp what society says? I mean, there's a big group of them, 400 prophets, right? Do I just want a prophet to rubber stamp what I was hoping to hear? That's what Paul warned about itching ears. Oh, uh, President Nelson, could you just scratch right here and tell me everything is well? Zion prospereth, all is well, and no need to repent. In other words, prophet, can you tell me things that you don't have to be a prophet to say? That to me is the great irony. We want prophets, but we don't want them to act like prophets. We want them just to go with the flow and say that society is right. I've met p people who have left the church and said, when was the last time a prophet said anything prophetic? To which I always want to respond, how are you defining prophecy? It's not just foretelling the future, it's forthtelling the present. You want to talk about a prophetic document? What about the proclamation of the world and the family? Oh no, that wasn't from God. Why? Because it doesn't agree with you? Or it doesn't agree with what the so-called prophets of our day, the, the ones of the world, are suggesting? The fact that they are willing to speak truth to power, the world's power, society's power, that they won't back down from things that they know they've received from God, 
I, I, but I hate them. They never say anything good about me. Careful. May we be humble. May we allow prophets to act like prophets, which often means telling us what we don't want to hear. If, if they're just rubber stamping something, I'm a little worried that they're not prophets of the living God. They're simply spokespeople for a world that wants to do things with the path of least resistance or you do you or moral relativism. The prophets of moral relativism are usually easy to hear because it's your voice just bouncing off of them. And they'll, no, it's, it's all good. You just do you. It's fine. Prophets of God aren't quite like that. Well, they go out in to get Micaiah anyway. And meanwhile, Ahab's prophets, quote unquote, are still promising victory. Some even bring visual aids. One brought like this iron horns and said, yes, with this, you will, you will push away all of this Syrian host and you'll win. It's like, wow, object lesson. I like it. Well, meanwhile, Micaiah finally shows up. And on the way, the messenger who gathered him said in verse 13, behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. We're all together on this, okay? Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them. Speak that which is good. Okay? Just go with the flow. Don't make waves. Please just agree with consensus. Popular opinion for crying out loud. The voice of the people is the voice of God, right? Vox populi, vox dei. Uh, actually, no, I, I was hoping we could reverse it, that the voice of God would become the voice of the people. I, I, I like your little Latin phrase. Can we reverse the order, though? Is that all right? Uh, we don't want the tyranny of popular opinion. We want an omniscient, omnipotent God calling the shots. In fact, the way they said it, just speak that which is good. Makes me wonder, well, which do you want? What's good on the ear or what's truth on the part of God? Take your pick. Verse 14, Micaiah said, well, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Sorry, I got to go with truth, not just easy on the ears. That's actually the earlier Balaam also. I'm only going to say what God said. Just uh, Micaiah is much more faithful than Balaam ever was. Again, Elijah, if you're out there somewhere listening in, you're not alone. Micaiah is cut from your cloth. He's awesome. In fact, he's even a bit of a smack talker or uh, some comic relief just like you, because notice what happens next. Uh, he comes and they ask him, well, so what do you, everyone here says victory awaits. Go forward. What do you say, Micaiah? And he responds in verse 15. Oh, yeah, of course. Go and prosper for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. So I did as commanded. Uh, I gave him what he wanted to hear. Uh, itching ears. Was that sufficiently scratched, mighty king? Well, in verse 16, the king says to him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? Darn if you do, darn if you don't. It's like if I told you that, it, that no, this isn't the right, then you're going to hate me because here I am prophesying evil again, against you again. But I told you what you wanted to hear and you're still ticked off? Well, yeah, because I know it wasn't true. Huh. How'd you know that? Well, because it was what I wanted to hear. Oh, darn it. <clears throat> or I've always had this sinking suspicion that this was the wrong thing. Why do you think I asked for 400 people to reassure me that it's right? Do we do that sometimes? That our conscience is only one voice, but man, it's a loud one. That's why I try to get past feelings so I can tamp it down and get it to shut up. Um, but if I can get enough prophets, if I can get enough likes on social media, if I can get enough people out there, enough oh, professors in academia, if I can get enough pundits in politics, if I can get enough quote unquote experts to tell me that the ways of the world really are better than the ways of God, then I'm good, and I'll have confidence shutting up my conscience. I wonder about this, Ahab. You, you already know what you're doing is wrong. You didn't need me, let alone your 400 others. Ah, it's so interesting what's happening here. He sees right through it. So Micaiah says, okay, you got me. Let me tell you the truth. In verse 17... I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. In short, that will be an immediate defeat in this war, scattered upon the hills. And if you want to look bigger picture, a foreshadowing of what's going to happen to Israel in the, in the long term. 
a scattering, not, not just upon these hills of Ephraim or of Syria, but across the lands of the north in the scattering of Israel. Verse 18, the king of Israel says to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? I told you. And you picture Jehoshaphat looking almost like, Are you serious? Are you not watching yourself here? Uh, you were mad when he told you the truth, and now you're mad when he lies to make you feel better. Uh, you're a mess, Ahab. I, I'm wondering about this alliance. Uh, you, you seem a little bit unhinged. If you, if you knew, why did you ask in the first place? Micaiah then adds another story to the mix. And this is another place where I see some of his, oh, his Elijah-like qualities coming through. Because I think I, I get a sense that this is, oh, I'm just going to say something to, to, to push the, the, the buttons a little bit more. This one is a story he tells about God up in heaven, holding a council in heaven. Or maybe kind of a, a council of war, just like you guys are holding right here with your, your prophets and me and everybody else. So take your pick. There's just some conversation going on up above. And they decide, how do we get Ahab to go throw himself into harm's way and kill himself in battle? Now you picture Ahab like, wait, is this really, did, did this really happen? And a little twinkle in Micaiah's eyes. Like, oh, it's just, this, here's this message from God, okay? In this heavenly council, there's a spirit that, that volunteers. Kind of a here am I, send me sort of a moment where he says to God, oh, I can, I can definitely get uh, Ahab to go mar march headlong towards self-destruction. I mean, he's, in a way, he's been doing that his whole life. We can just kind of finish the job today. In verse 22, this volunteering spirit says, I will go forth. I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. So go forth and do so. Now therefore behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Now this is a weird one as we try to, wait, is, did this really happen? Did God send a lying spirit and that's why these prophets have led Ahab astray? It doesn't sound like the God I know. Well, that's one reason why I would suggest that Micaiah, with a twinkle in his eye, is making this whole thing up. I mean, he just pulled a joke on, on Ahab to begin with. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, you'll win. Go for it. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Crossing my fingers here behind my back uh, so you know that I'm kidding. And yeah, he knew. Actually, not in the King's Version, but in the Chronicles Version, there's actually Joseph Smith translation. It helps. Uh, not sure why it's not in the King's Version too. But then again, Joseph never felt like he was completely done uh, with the JST. So he caught it in Chronicles, but didn't catch it in Kings. There, it's a lying spirit from the start. That God isn't sending a lying spirit, but a lying spirit comes and says, oh, let me, let me help with this. Uh, and actually, in that verse I just read, where it says, the Lord hath put a lying spirit, in the Chronicles version, in the JST of the Chronicles version, it's not that the Lord put a lying spirit into these false prophets. It's that the Lord found a lying spirit in these prophets these false prophets. And that, that helps our, our theology. It helps our, our view of God. Like he's not doing weird things and like sending lies. And it's kind of like back in, in Exodus, that God is hardening Pharaoh's heart. What? No, he doesn't do that. Okay. Uh, but again, if this is kind of a, just a, a tall tale on, on Micaiah's part, it's a perfect one where it's like, huh, you think these are true prophets. Well, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and if it's God's will for you to die in battle, because didn't you hear some prophecy about dogs and blood and all that kind of stuff? Well, if that's the case, then what better way to do it than to have a false spirit in a true prophet? Since that's, of course, the people that have come to, that you've assembled. A false spirit in a true prophet. Because if that's not the case, then what's the only other option? Yeah, maybe a true spirit trying to work through false prophets, but they're not telling you the truth? I am. No lying spirit in me, mighty king. Well, a little bit of one, but I was just playing on a joke and I knew you'd get it. Okay. This is a great, a great story. Well, Ahab's ticked. Uh, I do not appreciate your sarcasm, your humor, your tall tales, or anything else. Uh, I don't want your prophecies, true or false, good or bad, so get out of my sight. He sends him to prison. Uh, and in fact, he says, uh, you're not getting out of prison until I come home victorious. How's that? You're going to start hoping that you're wrong. 
You're going to start hoping that that lying spirit is actually a true one, that I will win, because when I get home, I'll let you out. No harm done. Well, Micaiah responds, well, I'm going to be stuck here for a while then, because if you come home, then I falsely prophesied, but I didn't. So yeah, you're not coming back. Sure enough, Ahab goes into battle. You can tell he's a little nervous about this, because guess what he does? He disguises himself. I don't want to look like a king out there, because in wartime, it's always better to take down officers than infantry. If you can destroy the leaders, then the followers don't know where to go. And so if you wear your royal robes, you've just painted a target on your chest. So here's uh, maybe Jehoshaphat being a little naive and a little too trusting and Ahab being a little too slick and too sinister because Ahab turns to Jehoshaphat and says, tell you what, I'm just going to go dressed. I'm going to dress down. Nothing worse than being overdressed to a battle. So I'm going to just put on some other robes and things, uh, not kingly ones, and just look like I'm a mere soldier. You, on the other hand, I mean, you're the mighty king of, of Judah. Look at all the great things you've done down south. You should probably maintain your royal robes while we march off into battle together. And Jehoshaphat falls for it. It's like, oh, okay, I guess. Okay, you really don't want to dress up? Oh, okay, fine. You see what Ahab's doing? I want them to kill you, not me. Especially if I just have, if I've had Micaiah's words uh, ringing in my ears that I'm a goner. No, I've got to, I've got to shift the attention to my so-called ally that I still have some enemy feelings towards. Well, so far it seems to be working. The battle ensues. The Syrians start chasing down, not Ahab, but Jehoshaphat. But right when it gets to a point where they're about to slay him, they've got him surrounded. He cries out. They recognize, wait, that's not, that's not Ahab. And they let him go. Now, in the king's version, it's pretty naturalistic in terms of just recognition and then departure. In the chronicle's version, it's much more miraculous. There's an element of divine intervention here that I love. So from the chronicle's version, 2 Chronicles 18.31, came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, it is the king of Israel. So Ahab's plan is working. They thought it was him. Therefore, they compassed about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out. Now, that's where the... King's version ends, but here's what Chronicles adds. And the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. So God's looking out for his righteous servant here. Meanwhile, verse 34, and a certain man drew a bow at a venture. So he's just kind of pulling it back and letting it go. Some unnamed archer here. This is totally random. Certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. This tiny little chink in the armor between where it's all connected. I mean, what are the odds? This is a complete, there's no way this could happen unless it was <laughs> divinely orchestrated. Wherefore, he said unto the driver of his chariot, turn thine hand, carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Well, wounded is an understatement. He is mortally wounded. And by the time the driver takes him home, Ahab has bled out in the chariot and he's dead. He's then buried in Samaria. Now, we'll go back to my, Micaiah's prophecy. His was, Ahab will be defeated in battle, and he was, at the, in the most random way. You stacked all the odds in your favor, and the guy that you painted a huge target on his chest was preserved by God. You, on the other hand, with actual armor underneath your, your soldier's uh, garb, you got struck by accident? Mm, no accident there. So Micaiah was absolutely right in his prophecy. But what about Elijah's prophecy earlier about the dogs licking up Ahab's blood? I mean, he was received a proper burial as a king of Israel? Well, keep reading. Verse 38, after the burial. One washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood and they washed his armor according unto the word of the Lord which he spake. So even in a way that that prophecy didn't seem possible, it was fulfilled. God's words always are. Meanwhile, Ahab's son Ahaz Ahaziah then takes the throne. But as is usually the case, we shift gears back away from Ahab back to his counterpart in the south, Jehoshaphat in Judah. And in verse 43, it says that he walked in all the ways of Asa his father. That's good. Good example to follow except for the very end of his life, right? He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, 
Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away for the people offered and burnt incense yet in the high places. Some old habits, some wicked traditions are just really hard to root out. And so there's still some places where people are doing what they shouldn't, idolatry. And by the end of the chapter and the end of this week's lesson, verse 50, Jehoshaphat dies, he's buried, and the, the, the baton, the, the scepter, passes to his son Jehoram. Now, like I said, that's where kings ends the story and where the book of 1 Kings comes to a close. And then next week we'll turn the page and start 2 Kings and we'll get to meet Elisha and, and be up and running with some a new cohort of kings in Israel and Judah, most of whom will be bad. Okay. Well, please don't turn off the, the lesson yet because this is where we really do need to go back to Chronicles to hear the rest of the story of Jehoshaphat because he is awesome. Uh, and what we saw from Chronicles in chapter 17 gave us the backstory of this incredible righteous man. Well, now let's see him in the aftermath of this battle. Uh, it's really important that we see it. So go back with me to 2 Chronicles 19 and 20, and this is where we'll really end this week's lesson. Okay, Two really important chapters. Uh, in 19, you get to see Jehoshaphat's repentance and his reform. Wait, repentance? What did he do wrong? Well... He went to war against the Syrians. That's not a bad thing. But he went with the Israelites, and that was. Because Ahab especially? Come on, Jehoshaphat. You've got to be a better judge of character than that. Jehu the seer, we met him earlier, he comes to Jehoshaphat, and he says to him in verse 2 of 2 Chronicles 19, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. There again is an example of misplaced mercy. This is love. That's the word he used. Do you love them that hate the Lord? This is love at the expense of law. And as I've said before, that's a contrary that's really hard to prove, especially in our day where love is so vaguely defined, but so powerful as far as its cultural cachet is concerned, that, man, if I can say love, even if I don't really tell you what I mean by it, then you can't say anything against it. Not a word. Love wins. Oh, well, rhetorically, you better believe it does. Oh, no matter what kind of love I'm talking about. And I won't allow love to ever say no. I won't allow love to have limits or boundaries or self-protection or protection of the other person that I love, which is why I say no to them. We got to balance this. This is a tough contrary. And Jehoshaphat got it wrong. Okay? Trying to go to the, the, the assistance of Ahab. So there is a bit of wrath. There's some, some divine uh, indignation against you. Nevertheless, he says in the next verse, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. I love that God can balance both of these. He sees our sin, even in a really good person like Jehoshaphat. He sees the sin and calls it out, so you can overcome it. But even when you make a real bad mistake and do something stupid, he then points out your goodness. He sees that too and applauds you for it. It's amazing how he is correcting and congratulating constantly uh, in this perfect balance. It's like bumper bowling right between justice and mercy, trying to help us to get to the end of the lane. Now, Jehoshaphat takes this rebuke well, and I'm proud of him for that. He redoubles his efforts at spiritual reform in his kingdom. In verse 4, he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, from his southern tip to his northern edge, and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. This gentle rebuke from Jehu brought him back. Well, maybe that's all it will take for my people. And he goes about probably maybe junior companions with a traveling priest or a Levite, and he's bringing Israel back to God. What better example of righteous leadership could you ask for? Then verse 5, he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, take heed what ye do. Any idea how important it is that what you're doing to establish righteousness among the people? For ye judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. So don't be bribed. Don't do it just because people want you to do it. I just saw that up north. That doesn't work. So make sure you are judging righteous judgment. That's that great JST in Matthew 7.1. It's not judge not that you be not judged. 
That's unfortunately the way the world has taken it. Like, oh, who, who am I to judge? I'm not going to say a thing. You just, you do you and moral relativism and rubber stamp everything. Those are the priests of, of Ahab or the prophets of Ahab. Instead, what's the JST say? Judge not unrighteously, but judge righteous judgment. And that's the exact advice that Jehoshaphat is giving to his, to his judges, which makes sense since Jehoshaphat means, his name means Jehovah has judged. I want God to make the judgment calls here. We are his earthly counterparts, so we need to make sure he's part of the judgment, part of every decision. Why do you think I asked Ahab if he'd prayed about it? We need to inquire of the Lord. Je Jehoshaphat, so far so good. And it gets even better in chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles. This is, this is the place where you really see Jehoshaphat in all of his glory. Now, at this point, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and a few other ites out there are combining to attack Judah. Uh, you live righteously, and you'll get a target on your back, and that's what's happening here. And Jehoshaphat hears about it. He receives word. And verse 3, here's his immediate reaction. Jehoshaphat feared. Now, is this fear over faith? Is this, what, what is this? Well, notice how he resp responds to this emotion. On the one hand, you can't, you're about to get attacked by this coalition of enemy kings. I'd probably feel nervous too. Uh, he feared, but next step, he set him to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. His fear prompted his faith. Uh, he recognized it and like, man, I'm going to need all the help I can get. So I'm going to set myself to seek the Lord. I got to put up got, got my A game spirituality here because it's going to be called upon. I need all the, the people behind me. So I'm going to gather them and proclaim a fast everywhere. So notice what he did was turn to God. What he didn't do was turn to others. He didn't turn to Israel like Israel had just turned to him. He'd learned from that mistake. He didn't turn to others like his father Asa had done. And so he's learned from that mistake as well. Instead, he turns to the Lord and fasts. Now, that's a strange oh, military tactic. Uh, in some ways, maybe not quite as bad, but still weird. Uh, compare that to, let's circumcise the entire army, the first thing we do once we step into enemy territory. But that's what Joshua did. Yes, covenant is what's going to protect you. Uh, so do that. Uh, or march around uh, a city and blow trumpets and yell? That's weird. Well, any weirder than how are we going to take on this enemy that's bearing down upon us? Quit eating. Fast. Now, this isn't the mistaken fast that Saul raised when he wasn't worthy to even call for one, and they're in the battle itself. This is beforehand. If I see enemies on the horizon that I need to prepare myself better for, then turn to God. And I trust in this small self-sacrifice to help God see how serious I am in need of his help. There's actually an amazing story, by the way, speaking of the power of fasting. Is this really going to do anything? Is this really going to work? Uh, way back in the, what, 50s when Dwight D. Eisenhower was president of the United States and he had a secretary of agriculture with a different title. Not just Mr. Secretary, but Elder Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was Ezra Taft Benson. And President Benson was tough and strong and bold and uh, to a fault at some times. But in this moment, there was a drought, speaking of sealing the heavens, a drought in Texas. Not sure if Elijah called for it or somebody else, but there was a drought going on and famine in the land and everyone was worried. And they didn't know to go to God, so they went to the Secretary of Agriculture and said, come on, Secretary Benson, you're in charge of crops. I know you can't control the weather, but you can control government funds and you can declare a state of emergency and somehow help the farmers and subsidize things and be okay. Okay, get us through this drought. Well, instead, uh, President Benson didn't like subsidies. Um, he wanted people to be independent. And he turned to the governor of the state of Texas and said to him, I know the solution. You need to proclaim a statewide day of fasting and prayer and ask God for rain. Since he's the one that can end this drought, I can't. Now, can you imagine being a politician and you get that news from your, your, your leader? Your, uh, and how do I face the people and say, um, yeah, the U.S. government doesn't want to subsidize our farming. They want us to fast and pray for rain. Well, thankfully, Texas is Bible Belt. Uh, so maybe they knew their, 
their Second Chronicles 20, uh, maybe they had just enough faith to give it a shot. And they did. And it rained. And some of the newspaper headlines in Texas read things like, Secretary Benson has connections that are out of this world. <laughs> oh, he did. And we all can. Jehoshaphat does. And he's seeking to rely on those connections instead of the horizontal earthly alliances that can sometimes lead to problems they had for him. Great, great example. Now, Jehoshaphat gathers the people. Where? To the temple. It's, he's got home court advantage, right? It's there in Jerusalem, uh, his hometown. And he begins praying there. And in 2 Chronicles 20, his prayer goes from verse 6 to verse 12, and it is beautiful. It's not a temple dedicatory prayer, but he's dedicating himself to God at this temple. In verse 6, he begins, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? See, there he's reaffirming what he believes about God. He's not saying, are you, the, are you these things or not? He knows that he is these things and is expressing that confidence and trust. Oh, in heaven, you rule your power, your might. No one can withstand you. Certainly not these Moabites and Ammonites and other ites. In verse 7, Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? There he's reaffirming the covenant relationship. This is a land of promise, and we know you keep your promises. In verse 8, And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name. We're right here standing in front of it, saying, If when evil cometh upon us, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we've been through all of those, if we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. Jehoshaphat just quoted great-great-great-grandpa Solomon at the dedicatory prayer. He stood here, he knelt here, he spread his arms to heaven, and he prayed this prayer, that if we ever find ourselves in a jam, self-inflicted or otherwise, if we turn back to this place, back to your name, that you'll come to our rescue. Here he is remembering the promises of a temple dedicatory prayer and the power and promises that are associated with the house of God. And then in verse 12, after he explains what he's up against and reminds God that, hey, it's not our fault we didn't start this thing, he then prays, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? I want Jehovah to judge. That's my name after all, Jehoshaphat. For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. There's not enough flesh on our arm to trust in. We only trust in yours. Neither know we what to do. I'm totally ignorant. Why do you think I started this whole thing with fear? But our eyes are upon thee. And his prayer over now. All Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. This battle is going to be a family affair. And we are all uniting our faith and coming before God in our humility, in our need. And everything he admits there. I have no power, which is why I need your omnipotence. I have no knowledge of what to do, and so in my ignorance, can I trade that out for your omniscience? Our eyes are upon thee, and we look to the hills from which we find our strength. God, will you come through for us? If you ever find yourself fearful or facing an enemy that seems bigger than what you can handle, I don't know of a better prayer to to model your prayers upon. Remember who God is. Remind yourself of that. Remind yourself of the covenant that you've made with him, and better yet, that he's made with you. Remember and remind yourself of the power of the temple and the endowment of power from on high that you received there. Remember the promises and power of his holy place. And then... Hand it over to him, trusting in his omniscience and omnipotence. 
as he said, our eyes are upon him and he's worth looking to. In answer to this glorious prayer, the Spirit of the Lord descends, not on Jehoshaphat, who offered the prayer, but upon a Levite. His name's Jehaziel. Uh, I can't think of a better name for someone to get the answer to this prayer because Jehaziel means God sees or Jehovah watches over. Or had Jehoshaphat ended? Our eyes are on thee. Well, who's the answer coming from? From someone who personifies the fact that God is looking on us too. He sees, he's aware, he's heard the prayer. And this Levite says in response, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. And now King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you. The Spirit's given me these words. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. That's exactly what they needed to hear. It's what they were hoping for. It's not, we don't have flesh on our arms. We don't have knowledge in our mind, but we know thou dost, and so our eyes are on you. And here, I love that it comes to him and not to Jehoshaphat. Good thing Jehoshaphat had earlier been restoring priests and Levites to their proper place, <laughs> uh, teaching people and setting forth judges to judge righteously. And here's one that's the right man at the right time with the right spirit. And he receives the answer to this prayer. Jehaziel then tells them a few more details where the enemy is going to attack and where the army of, of Judah should go to be able to confront them, but not quite confront them, really just to have their eyes on God, who has his eyes on them. He says in verse 17, ye shall not need to fight in this battle, but set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Sound like what Moses said at the shores of the Red Sea? Except Moses was wrong. <laughs> Jehaziel is right. And God is promising them a complete victory with no need of much personal participation. Just stand still. I got this. Your eyes are upon me. Well, let me give you something to see. And so it goes. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. Here's a king used to people kneeling before him, and he's on his knees before his king, the king of kings. And all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. With that spirit, no more fear, only faith, they go forth to battle. And Jehoshaphat tells them in verse 20, Hear me, O Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets so shall ye prosper. Remember, those are the two things that people always doubt, and therefore the two things that we must always remember. That's one of the most famous things Jehoshaphat ever said. And for some, it's the only thing they remember from Second Chronicles, but it's worth remembering. You want to be established, build upon the rock of the Redeemer, then believe in the Lord your God. You want to prosper, so move forward from this rock and build upon it, then Believe in his prophets, because they'll show you the construction plans as we try to grow up in God. This is exactly what they're trying to do here. Je Je Jehoshaphat is reminding the people, trust God. We, we're prepared. He's blessed us with his spirit. He's promised to be there for us. And trust his, believe his prophets. In this case, believe Jehaziel. Those weren't his words. I've seen prophets do that. Those were God's words, and we can bank on them. Verse 21, then, when he had consulted with the people. So kind of like great-great-grandpa David doesn't think he has all the answers himself, but consults. Here's the next part of the strategy. He appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness, a great phrase that we think of with the temple, as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Now you want to talk about strange strategies. He's not appointing soldiers, he's appointing singers. Uh, he's emphasizing worship over war. And he's talking about holiness and beauty rather than military might. This actually reminds me of what President Hinckley said, the first talk after the 9-11 attacks in 2001. It wasn't bomb shelters that he was talking about, it was righteousness and repentance. 
That's where we'll be safe and secure. And that's what Jehoshaphat is recommending. Now, as the Moabites and the Ammonites are on their march toward Judah, they pass through Edomite territory on the way, and the Edomites don't like that. Uh, so there's a fight there, and the Edomites get totally destroyed. Well, there goes another enemy of Israel. But in the aftermath of that, there's so much chaos or confusion that the uh, Edomites and the Moabites, or excuse me, the Moabites and the Ammonites then turn on each other, and they fight each other to the death. And so again, stand still and see the salvation of God. Well, you know, stand still and see their self-destruction. And, and that's it. There, there went the battle. We didn't even have to fight. They fought each other. I mean, you could picture them if they were only logical thinkers. Like, we're about to get attacked by this coalition. They're, what do you mean stand there and do nothing? How is this possibly going to happen? Well, it just did. And in fact, verse 24, when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness... They looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth. None escaped. Now notice where that happened. Where did they finally see that God was right about all this, that the prophecy was fulfilled? When they came toward the watchtower. Now, and Ezekiel is a great place to study this, but we talk about prophets being watchmen on the tower. Why? Well, because they're at a higher elevation. They have a vantage point that they can see further than we can. Now, that doesn't mean we'll never be able to see what they see. It just takes us a while to get there. But once we have the same sight as the seers and can see what the prophets have seen, ah, I'm so glad they showed us that in advance. Because if we would have waited till we saw it, it would have been too late to prepare. I do love this little... And now this metaphor, that once we come to the same watchtower, we'll see what they saw a long time ago. The challenge for us is to believe them beforehand so we can actually prepare, so we can actually prosper, as Jehoshaphat promised. Now, with the battle ended before it even began for them, they spend the next three days gathering the spoils of war from the casualties that they never killed. They killed each other. Uh, three days, this is plundering the riches of Egypt all over again. And knowing Jehoshaphat with fortresses and cities of storage, I'm sure they're going to go to good purposes. But after three days of gathering, on the fourth day, verse 26, they assembled themselves in the valley of Beracha, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the valley of Beracha unto this day. Any guesses what Beracha means? He gave us the hint in the middle. It means blessing. There they were blessed by God, and maybe even more importantly, there they blessed God, thanked Him, praised His name, worshipped. That's a blessing to even be able to do that. Now, near the end of his life, Je Jehoshaphat ends up making an alliance with Israel. It didn't seem like it was for military purposes it seemed like it was just to build some ships. So this sounds more like trade than conquest, okay? I mean, I hope he learned some lessons and we're not supposed to make alliances, but this is different. And so I think this is okay. And Israel could use some help. Actually, we could use some help if we want to go shipping uh, because we're not really good at that stuff. But the Israelites up north with Sea of Galilee on one side and Mediterranean real close at hand on the other. And Tyre and Sidon's right there, and uh, that's the Phoenicians, and they're famous for, for shipping. So uh, this could really help our kingdom uh, more than just helping theirs. But unfortunately for Jehoshaphat and for Judah, because Israel's king, Judah at least had some good kings now and then. Israel is almost an uninterrupted list of the worst possible people. <laughs> And that was the case when in this, during this alliance. And because of the wickedness of the people in Israel and Israel's king, uh, God condemns the whole enterprise and breaks down the ships and nothing comes of it. Now, this is not exactly what Jehoshaphat had hoped for. So there is a, a bit of mistake there at near the end of Jehoshaphat's life. But let's not end with that error. Let's rewind just a bit to what we, ended, what we saw before about this valley, this valley of blessing. If we go back there and end our lesson for this week, uh, this is an amazing geographical location. 
the Valley of Blessing that elsewhere in the Old Testament will be referred to as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's how we make the association. And in the same breath, or the same chapter at least, is also called the Valley of Decision. Now that all is found in Joel chapter 3, which puts all of this in the context of the second coming. We'll see this again when we get to Joel, but that's like December or something, okay? So here we are. Uh, we need to see this as a preview. And when we get to Joel, we'll have to remember Jehoshaphat, okay? So when Jehoshaphat is there in the valley and blessing God and being blessed by God with all these incredible spoils of war, and I can't believe that God has judged us so kindly and mercifully that he spared us from a war of self-destruction. Now, do you see how this might have sparked some thoughts in Joel's mind when he's thinking about the end of the world? Armageddon, second coming, the destruction of the wicked. Is this a war of mutual, mutually assured destruction? And, but the faithful, the righteous, will be spared and they'll be able to stand still and see the salvation of God? Will we remember our covenants and the promises of God and fast and pray and prepare and lay hold of our in, uh, the power with which we've been endowed from on high? I mean, talk about powerful parallel. Well, go with me to Joel chapter 3 and see how the valley of Jehoshaphat comes into play. Joel 3, 1 and 2. For behold, in those days, the last days, and in that time, the end time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. There we see the valley of Jehoshaphat as a place of gathering, gathering Israel, but also gathering all nations to pass judgment upon them. Remember, Jehoshaphat means Jehovah judges. And here he's judging Israel. This is a final judgment kind of scene. Uh, then in, later in the chapter, verse 12 and 13, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There it is again. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Judgment day, I'll sit to judge. Jehoshaphat, Je Jehovah judges. The press is full, the fats overflow. That means the wine vats. Here it's written fats, but it's vats. Remember in the book of Revelation, when it shows the scene and describes the he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored, as we sing in Battle Hymn of the Republic. Or as Jesus comes back in robes of reminding red to show to people that I have trodden the winepress alone. That's what Joel is prophesying of. And it all happens right there in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then the very next verse, he shifts the title slightly, but in profound ways. Joel 3.14 Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now in the midst of this conversation, where twice already in this chapter we've been primed to know what valley it is, the valley of Jehoshaphat, he then switches it up and replaces it twice with a different word, the valley of decision. Well, what are we being judged for? In the valley of Jehoshaphat, we're being judged for our decisions. Good, bad, and everything in between. And how have we done? Why did Jesus have to trample out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored? Why did he have to stain all of his raiment? To take out of us and put onto him the consequences of our poor decisions. As we sat in the valley of decision with Ger Gerizim on one side and Ebo on the other, blessings and curses and life and death, and sometimes we chose death, self-inflicted. And there's a, a price to be paid for that. But there was a price that was paid for that, and it was Christ's blood. The valley of decision, the valley of judgment, the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of blessing is what he called it first. All of this is the greatest blessing God could ever give us, for he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to suffer and die for us. 
to pay that price in Gethsemane and on Calvary to break the bands of sin and death and allow for all of us to come home. Is there any more glorious blessing than that? Is there any more greater judgment than that passed in the valley of Jehoshaphat? The very next verse in Joel 3, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Sound like second coming, last days? But keep going again. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. There's the real lion of the tribe of Judah. He will utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake for the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Just like he was for Jehoshaphat. Fighting his people's battles for them. He'll do the same for us. The hope of his people it's exactly what he is, if we believe in him and if we believe in the prophets who have taught us of him. I don't know a better visual aid than this valley of Jehoshaphat, this valley of decision. Actually, there's one more level to this. This valley of Jehoshaphat probably was miles east of Jerusalem, somewhere out there in the wilderness by the watchtower somewhere out where the Moabites and the Ammonites were taking on the Edomites. And yet, centuries later, centuries after the New Testament was written, somehow the Valley of Jehoshaphat began to be associated with the Kidron Valley. And the most famous site in the Kidron Valley is the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, rethink the titles. The Valley of Blessing, no greater blessing than the Atonement and all that proceeds from it. The Valley of Judgment, it's because of what took place in Gethsemane that God can pass a good judgment upon us, a merciful one. The Valley of Decision, can you imagine if you made your every decision as if you were in the Garden of Gethsemane? seeing Christ beside you, suffering for the poor decisions that you've made or are about to make. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Oh yes, the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. But it's a day of more than decision. It's a day of judgment. It's a day of blessing. It's a day of Jehoshaphat. It's his valley after all. I testify of all that Jesus did to make possible victory as we stand still and watch his salvation unfold. I'm grateful for the Elijahs that have shown us that God will multiply meal and will bless before and after any time we need him. I'm grateful for victory on Mount Carmel over any enemy. I'm thankful for still small voices that are reassuring. When earthquakes shake faith, or when fire burns down hopes, or when wind blows away, blessings we want to hold on to. Still small voices will come and reassure us. And so be still. Know that He is God. And kneel in your valley of decision and decide wisely.